Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Committee on Veterans and Legal Affairs. Uh, we've got a quorum present and we're um, uh, meeting virtually today to, to go over a, a number of bills that we have before us for work session, as well as a public one public hearing in the afternoon. Um, and, and apologies again for the delay. We, we're meeting on an unusual committee day for us. Uh, we had special permission to meet today. So um, we have a lot of members who serve on multiple committees and especially this time of year, it's just very busy with the legislature. Uh, but before we get started uh, with the agenda, we'll begin with committee introductions and we'll start with uh, uh, Chairman, House Chairman Chiazzo. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, everybody. Chris Chiazzo, House District 28, beautiful West Scarborough. Happy Thursday. Okay, uh, Representative Kinney. Good morning. I'm Representative Kinney. I'm uh, Mary Ann Kinney. I represent House District 99, nine towns in Western Waldo County. I'll be in and out today because I'm actually leaving for a conference in the morning. So right. I have a bunch of things I'm doing today. <laughs> Great. Uh, Representative McCrate. Good morning, I'm Jay McCrite, representing Harpswell, West Bath, and Northeast Brunswick in the House. Uh, Representative Supika. Good morning, I'm Laura Supika, and I represent House District 126, which is a portion of Bangor. Representative Dolliff. Good morning, Josanne Dolliff from District 115, which includes five towns in the beautiful Western Mountains, and it is beautiful out there, except for the Black Plot. <laughs> and Representative Wood. Good morning. I'm Barb Wood, and I represent House District 38, which is the western end of the peninsula in Portland. Okay. Um, and with us today, we have our committee analyst, uh, Janet Stoko, as well as our committee clerk, Karen Montel. And uh, again, before we get started, I just wanted to recognize that we are also um, uh, joining us today. We're also, we also have uh, Chief Francis from the Penobscot Nation, as well as uh, Chief Peter Paul uh, from the Aroostook Band of Micmacs. And I apologize if I'm missing anyone else from the, the list of attendees. Uh, for, but we, al we also do have um, Representative Newell as well as Ambassador Dana as well. So thank you just uh, for attending today. Um, on our agenda, we've got a number of bills for work session, but we will start with LD 554, uh, an act to create gaming equity and fairness for the Native American tribes in Maine. <coughs> And so this is uh, Representative Collings's bill. Um, and if possible, I think I'd like to call in uh, the tribal attorneys who've been working on this bill uh, uh, diligently and, and to offer an amendment, which I, I believe we just sent out, right, right, Janet, as well to the email list so people can see it. Um, and where they've worked on this, uh, perhaps we can have attorney Hinton come in and um, and kind of walk us through the elements of it as well. And welcome, uh, Mr. Hinton. Thanks for being here. Yeah. Thank you very much. And are 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 you good to walk through or uh, the amendment, or is there anyone else who? Or okay. I would be happy to. Yes. Okay. Great. Thanks. Um, so, Janet, if you can please uh, screen share, and then we can kind of walk through the amendment to the original bill. It's been a while since we've uh, worked on this, so um, it's, it's a good kind of refresher as well. So you've got the floor, Mr. Hinton. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Lucchini, um, members of the VLA committee. I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity to be with you again today uh, to speak again on LD 554. Since the last time um, that we uh, that we met on this bill, um, there's been a I think a, a pretty significant amount of constructive discussion um, between the tribal attorneys and the attorney general's office, um, and those discussions have um, resulted in uh, this amendment that you see before you today. Um, the the uh, bill as initially introduced only included what you see on your screen here as uh, paragraph four 
that begins with the bolded word gaming. Um, and there was, of course, a summary at the end. Everything that follows you know, this introductory paragraph um, has been added um, as a result of, of discussions and, uh, and, and legal work and research. Um, and so I will uh, go through uh, these paragraphs now um, one by one at a high level. Um, the subparagraph A um, is specifically intended to authorize the governor to uh, negotiate and enter into a class three tribal state gaming compact upon the request of a request, uh, excuse me, upon the, the making of a request from uh, the Passamaquoddy tribe, Penobscot Nation, or Holton Band of Malice. Um, and, and this section also uh, specifies that the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act governs the process by which a compact um, is executed and, and takes an effect. Um, this uh, paragraph was added uh, in response to a very specific legal issue um, that has come up in a, in a number of other states. Um, in, in many states, uh, state legislatures, um, when dealing with the potential for tribal state gaming agreements, um, will preemptively authorize their executive, their governor, um, to negotiate and enter into a compact. Um, this is uh, the sort of language that uh, appears in, in state uh, statutes in a number of places around the country. Um, without language like this, the simple authority to execute um, uh, tribal state gaming negotiations and compacts have in other places been um, vulnerable to legal challenge on the grounds that a governor lacks authority to negotiate and enter into a compact. So this paragraph A, um, is just to make clear that if this legislation were to be enacted, that the governor can um, execute uh, lawfully um, a negotiation with, with the tribes. It doesn't um, mandate uh, any particular outcome for a compact negotiation, but, but paves the way for those negotiations to take place pursuant to state and federal law. Okay, hey, uh, and sorry, Attorney Hinton, if I can just interrupt for a second. I want to also say that we have uh, Chief Sabatis with us as well today. I didn't see her in the attendees list, but I want to make sure that we recognize the, that, that Chief Sabatis from, uh, from the Maliseys is also here. So sorry to interrupt. Yeah. No worries. Thank you, Senator uh, and Chief Sabatis. I'm glad to hear that you're with us today. Um, so subparagraph B, just to continue to move along, um, subparagraph B, um, provides that uh, with respect to uh, tribal gaming activities, um, the, the laws to be applied to tribal gaming operations, so that the conduct of gaming are not state laws, but would be at a high level uh, federal and state laws as, as discussed in these subparagraphs. So just to take um, a step back, um, if you're operating under a tribal state gaming compact, which is negotiated in class three gaming, as the state and the tribe enter into agreements that deal with um, what laws, what regulatory uh, principles um, apply to different aspects of how gaming is conducted. Um, but there's also always the, the federal law overlay. The Federal Indian Gaming Regulatory Act very specifically governs the conduct of tribal gaming. Um, and so this section B and the subparagraphs that follow um, are intended to um, create a framework for the conduct of gaming in a manner that's consistent with federal and state law. Um, and because the main implementing act um, is the baseline for, for state and tribal jurisdiction, we know that state laws um, in, in many of the areas that would be uh, touched in a gaming con com context, um, state laws would apply. So this section is intended to create a framework where federal, tribal, um, and state laws will coexist, which is exactly what you have in a no negotiated gaming compact. Um, this language, though, um, is intended to uh, not just provide a baseline for, for class three gaming compacts, but also to ensure that if there is no tribal state gaming compact that's, that's um, executed between the tribes and the state, that um, there are baselines for various regulatory issues that come up in a, in a tribal gaming operation. 
Um, so I will start to go through these, uh, these Roman numerals now. Um, with respect to uh, health and safety laws, and here this includes food safety, sanitation, building construction standards, inspection, um, environmental protection, um, the, the tribes are required to uh, uh, follow rules and regulations that are, um, uh, the, the tribes have the ability to enter into and, and execute their own laws, but those laws can be no less rigorous than state law. So essentially all of the state law protections that would apply to, um, you know, really any sort of business, but a gaming business in particular, you know, these would be the sort of baseline um, uh, rules that would apply. Um, and uh, subparagraph B provides that in the event that a tribe does not pass a law that would regulate the area specified in, in um, subparagraph one, state law will apply. So essentially, um, until the tribe uh, until the tribe passes a law to regulate these uh, to deal with these regulatory issues, um, state law would apply. And so therefore, at any point um, in a tribal gaming operation under this legislation with respect to food safety, environmental, you know construction sort of standards, um, state law uh, will be the baseline and none of the rules applied will be any uh, less rigorous than state law. Uh, Subparagraph three um, is intended to address alcohol and to uh, essentially um, make clear that, uh, and, and at, at, at a high level, what this does not do is displace the state with respect to alcohol regulation. So uh, 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 an interesting part of federal Indian law is that um, tribal, uh, on tribal lands, the regulation of alcohol um, must be done in a manner consistent with state law. So that, that is federal law. Um, and so you know, that is the assumption that we have going into this. It's not as though the tribes would have the authority under any part of this legislation to circumvent the state's liquor laws. Um, what this subparagraph three does is uh, provide that with respect to where there would be approvals by uh, a municipal government um, for the purposes of issuing a liquor license, um, those uh, local approvals would be handled by the tribal nation, which is the local government for purposes of tribal lands. Um, and so that's what this subparagraph three does. Um, but I just wanted to point out that more broadly, the tribes would be um, um, handling liquor in a manner consistent with state law, just as with respect to the environment, you know, building construction, just how all of those rules would uh, and issues would also be regulated in a manner consistent with state law. Um, moving down to uh, paragraph C, paragraph C uh, is intended to ensure compliance with a very important and specific role in the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act. The Federal Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, and I'm sure that that Janet's great presentation to the, the committee during the last work session covered this, um, but the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act makes clear that tribal gaming operations uh, that are operated pursuant to IGRA um, cannot be subject to, uh, to taxation. Um, tribal gaming operations can, however, um, share revenue from their operations with uh, state and local governments. Often the state revenue share is, is that's typically done in a class three compact. Um, sometimes local revenue shares are done outside of compacts. Um, but in essence, that form of revenue sharing is not a tax if the revenue share from the tribal facility is done in exchange for uh, quantifiable economic benefits. Um, so, so what we've done here is to stipulate in a manner consistent with IGRA that um, tribal gaming operations um, are not subject to taxation but that tribal gaming operations could share their revenue uh, in exchange for uh, quantifiable economic benefits. Um, but again, that revenue share, um, it would be a, an issue of negotiation um, and revenue share um, in, in almost all contexts really only comes up in, in a tribal state class three compact. So uh, you know, our, our hope would be that pursuant to this legislation, 
with the governor having authority to negotiate a compact, a revenue sharing agreement could be made. Um, and so that is what uh, this paragraph three is intended to address. Moving down to subparagraph D, uh, here we have a, a definition section. Um, as you'll see, generally speaking, what we've done is uh, for these first two definitions, we've used um, it for class three gaming, we're, we're just cross-referencing the applicable federal law. Um, for this definition of, of gaming operations, um, and this ties back to how the overall um, uh, gaming operation will be regulated. Um, and when we refer to the, the environmental laws, the construction laws, that whole list of you know, regulatory areas, this def and all, those, all those rules would be tied to gaming operations as defined here. And this is really to ensure that um, any, uh, any sort of business or service um, that's related directly to a gaming facility um, would be regulated in a manner consistent with state law as is required uh, under the subsection uh, uh, B above. Um, uh, the definition of gaming facility here is, is also intended to just identify um, where the applicable uh, sections above will, will tie to in terms of the footprint of the gaming facility. Um, and, and just to, to distinguish between um, gaming facility and, uh, and gaming operations, gaming facility, as far as, as federal law is concerned, generally um, relates to the exact place where the gaming is conducted. Um, and this would include, you know, your, your, your floor where your, your bingo machines are or where the game, you know, the tables are, the back room areas, um, where all the sort of support services for the casino are located. And, and gaming operations would be your complementary services that support the gaming facility. So this could be potentially um, amenities associated with uh, a, a gaming facility, like you see in, in many, many casinos um, around the world. Um, the other definitions here, obviously tribal member is straightforward. It's just a reference to, um, to citizens of the respective tribal nations in Maine. And then we've included a definition um, of, of tribal entity um, and just define that as an entity that is um, majority owned by a tribal nation. And this is consistent with the definition of tribal entity that we see elsewhere in the federal Indian law context and adopted in state law in other places as well. And then the section two that we see here is just to ensure that um, this legislation, if approved and enacted by the legislature, um, is uh, fully authorized pursuant to the Settlement Act. Uh, the Settlement Act requires that amendments to the Settlement Act, which this would be, must be approved not just by the state, but also by each tribal community where those changes would take effect. Um, and so pursuant to that requirement, this section simply says that each tribal government must through its own lawmaking process, literally approve and essentially accept the uh, amendments to the Settlement Act that you see above here. Um, it's really important to note that this, that, that this contingent effective date doesn't actually um, authorize gaming in and of itself. So um, if, if if the legislation is signed by the governor and the next day approved by a tribal nation, gaming wouldn't start on day two. Keep in mind that the, the, the tribal nation would still need to engage in an in internal lawmaking process and then would need to have federal approvals in place prior to the conduct of gaming. So that's the sort of po tribal policy making process um, and, and legal process that would follow after enactment of the legislation. And that's what this section two is intended to get at. Um, and that covers uh, the legislation and the amendments. Thank you very much. Happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you uh, for walking us through the amendments. Um, any questions from the committee at this time? <clears throat> uh, Represent Chiazzo. <clears throat> thank you, Chairman Lucchini, and thank you, uh, Attorney Hinton. I apologize, the answer machine's going off in the background. Hopefully it's not bleeding in too much. This is the nature of the of, of the times. Um, two quick questions for you, Attorney Hinton. Um, in Section C, you, you, were, you were referring to the, the tax portion of it. 
Um, the question I have is, is the revenue sharing portion, is that something that would be fixed for the duration of the compact or is that something that's typically up for review after a certain period, you know, periodic review, whether it's a couple of years or whatever a specific duration is? That's a great question, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, I'd say that the extent to which revenue sharing levels change over the course of a compact, that in and of itself is uh, an issue for negotiation. Um, so, you know, generally you see one of two things happen. You either have a flat revenue share level that's negotiated starting on day one that carries forward through the life of the compact, or in some states, you see graduated revenue sharing levels. So um, oftentimes because these are new businesses um, and you know the businesses need to start up, you might see a lower revenue share when profits are generally you know, oftentimes just ramping up and revenue sharing might grow as the business grows. And so, you know, in some states like California, there are actually, um, you know, revenue sharing levels that are tied to the size of a gaming operation, for example. Um, and so there's a number of different ways that those issues could, could be addressed. Um, and I hope that answers your question. I just really quickly, I, I wanted to um, acknowledge that, that Chief Francis um, would, would like to say a couple of words about the bill from the Pops Foundation perspective. So, um, Chair Chiazzo, I, I'm happy to answer a follow-up. I just wanted to put that out there. Sorry for interrupting. Sure. Yeah, we can we can bring in uh, Chief Francis right now um, to to say some. Well, while you bring him in, Mr. Chair, if I could just a quick follow-up, Mr. Hinton, uh, on the membership side of things, I know there's um, how difficult would it be to expand that membership? Because I understand there might be uh, other other groups that want to join the the membership. Is that something that we would have to really expand on or is that something that we could simply just add another one to the list kind of thing? Sure. Well, each tribal government has its own laws for um, enrollment. And I, I, I mean, I could speak to the Passamaquoddy enrollment process. I couldn't speak to the other enrollment processes, but um, if for Passamaquoddy, for example, there are very specific um, enrollments to, you have, need to have you know, a certain blood quantum and demonstrate lineage. Um, and, and there's a, a committee that deals with um, enrollment requests. These are typically for you know, babies. Um, and, and from time to time, there will be um, uh, tribal members who were disconnected for the tribe for any reason who may be applying as adults, but they're all subject to the same rules. Um, and it's a very um, strict process. So, um, I, I mean, I, I won't speak for the, the policymakers for the tribe, but I would not anticipate seeing, you know, an expansion of enrollment um, under this definition. I mean, this is just to respect the fact that each tribal nation defines its citizens under its own laws. Yeah, I, I apologize. I didn't mean for individuals. I meant for another nation. Let's say I think there's there's interest now in, in the Micmacs joining as well. Um, is it, you know, is it easy to, to make that adjustment or would we have to also do other modifications to accommodate the Micmacs laws? Sure, sure, sorry, yeah, I, I, I understand now. I, um, I believe that the addition of, of a rustic band of Micmac here, um, I would think that it would be fairly straightforward from a drafting perspective. Um, I mean, I, I haven't looked at this issue in, in detail, but my, my hope would be that, you know, that the rustic band of Micmac would be able to be recognized alongside the other tribal nations, just as they're all, you know, listed in the various sections. Thank you, Sid, and apologies, Chief Francis. I will, I will defer the floor to you now. Welcome, Chief. Thank you, Chairman Lucchini, uh, Chairman Cazzo. I hope I said that right. Um, I appreciate being here this morning. I'll be very brief, um, and the timing of my comments, if they're off, uh, I apologize, but um, I just wanted to mention a couple of things, and I'll just defer to my testimony earlier in the public hearing, um, but uh, just the purpose of this legislation overall for the tribes, um, we really worked hard with our representatives to try to create a framework that involved the state, um, that looked out for everybody's best interest here, and, uh, and got to what the legislative resolve of the task force really wanted, and that was to um, focus on the restoration and recognition of tribal rights that have been broadly kind of um, prohibited under language um, in the in the Settlement Act. And we feel like 
the Indian Game and Regulatory Act uh, really provides, which was really a legislation federally written on behalf of state concerns, um, not tribal concerns. And we've been through the uh, the history of the of the legal uh, kind of uh, decisions that that provided for um, <clears throat> for tribes to you know uh, conduct gaming. Um, uh, through the U.S. Supreme Court, and then Congress, of course, creates IGRA to to fix um, everybody's concerns and interests. And so, so we believe this framework um, gets gets at exactly what we're trying to work towards, and that is um, a tribal state process um, in multiple areas that um, that require us to have a good conversation and um, and look out for the interest of everyone. Uh, the history at Penobscot, as I've mentioned, and and some of the other tribes as well, is you know, we were, and, um, and of course, uh, the Settlement Act nowhere mentions uh, the prohibition of gaming and really how could it a decade before the Indian Game and Regulatory Act comes out. Um, you know, so typically how it works with tribes is, um, you know, if you, you never give up your rights to what you already have, you always retain it. And of course, language, uh, complicated language and and ambiguities in the Settlement Act have been broadly used to prohibit the tribes in this in this area. So we were a little bit stunned when we lost the right to do that. And of course, the tribes are already in statute specifically and, and, and exclusively to conduct um, high stakes bingo operations, which has evolved um, in terms of technology and all of those things. Um, and we've been prohibited from upgrading that. And the effect on that really at uh, Penobscot was um, about 62 uh, part-time jobs we lost in 2014 um, after 40 years of, of operating and not being able to modernize that, that operation. Um, you know, unlike corporations, the, the, the tribe's revenues stay entirely in the state. Um, those go to local communities. It's, it's actually by statute a function of tribal government uh, with a requirement uh, for government governmental services with those revenues. And also, again, um, all of those resources um, stay within our state and, and within our, um, our local areas, unlike corporations um, with shareholders, uh, out-of-state interests, et cetera. So, um, so this bill is really intended to create that framework for, um, for and as Attorney Hinton mentioned, um, you know, even if this bill passes today, uh, there's a lot of work to do. Um, there's a lot of work to do um, in, in terms of uh, getting to agreement with the state, working with the state. And we think, you know, if we're looking to create a fair and equitable uh, gaming environment for tribes to pursue, nobody's asking for any specific project today, that, um, that there should be a roadmap uh, that allows us to respect and, and um, recognize uh, the tribe's governmental status, and also its responsibility to negotiate um, with its state partners. And so, um, so the bill really um, creates that framework to do that. So if we're going to have that equity and fairness, we, we feel like the mechanism is important to, um, to be able to um, allow the tribes to succeed, allow the state to succeed, and allow um, an in-state partnership that we see um, excel all over the country. And so I, I just wanted to um, just remind the committee that the, the goal and objective here is not to approve gaming pro um, projects with this uh, with this bill. The, the the bill is intended to create the path forward in a fair and equitable way where um, we can have equal say in negotiations in these um, in these talks. So um, we've been very cognizant of that in many areas of the of the um, uh, the work group process. And, and feel that's very important. So, um, so with that, I'll just, um, I'm gonna defer back to uh, the attorneys who have worked really hard and they will obviously be more helpful than I can on the technical stuff, but I appreciate um, the opportunity to, to be here and to talk about uh, you know, the tribal perspective a little bit and I'm happy to answer any questions that, that you may have about our intentions or, or what the uh, uh, goals and objectives are. Great, thank you, uh, Chief Francis. Any questions uh, from the committee? Um, rep oh, okay. Looks like we're good. Oh, Representative Dolov, yeah. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to unraise my hand, but I do have some questions and um, if either one of them can answer. Um, in section B, why do the laws not apply to the Passamaquoddy tribe and the others? Why are those tribes singled out that the laws wouldn't apply to them? Corey, why don't you go ahead with that? Thank you, Chief. Um, thank you for the question, Representative. Uh, the, the, the purpose of this section is to essentially address um, the jurisdictional issues and, that, that we would anticipate coming up when it comes to, uh, to a gaming facility. So under current main law, we know that the state would have overarching jurisdiction over a lot of these um, over a lot of these, uh, really any business activities on tribal lands that, that weren't within the, the specific exceptions that exist in the Settlement Act. Um, and so here, uh, this language is intended to create a framework to actually allow the tribes to regulate and to do these, to, to generate these businesses consistent with state law. So it's not sort of calling them out so much as it's, it's just laying um, clear indicators of what laws will apply. And essentially the rule is that state law will apply and will govern all of the different regulatory issues listed here until such time as the tribes pass laws that are no less stringent than state law. Um, so this ensures that there will be laws that are you know, as rigorous as the state has made them in place for um, all aspects of a tribal gaming operation. Um, and then that with respect to the conduct of the gaming itself, you know, how the games are played and the money is protected and security is run, the tribes would be relying on the Federal Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, all the federal regulations and the National Indian Gaming Commission um, for the, 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 the actual gaming facility operations themselves. I hope that answers your question. I'm happy to help, uh, you know, drill down into that further if you'd like. I guess I, I, maybe I don't understand that. I'm just thinking that why aren't the laws applied to all tribes? It's that simple in my head, but it may not be that simple. Uh, well, do you, I'm sorry, do you mean like why the rustic band of Micmac, for example, in, in um, Maine was were included here? Or do you mean other tribes that are not federally recognized or? Uh... Other tribes, I mean, B says, the laws do not apply and the Passamaquoddy tribes of Penobscot Nation, et cetera, and Holton. I'm just wondering why wouldn't the laws apply to those tribes? Well, I, I mean, this is a this would be a policy change. Um, and, and so, you know, right now, um, the tribes can't engage in these businesses at all. And if the tribes attempted to engage in gaming, um, it would violate both uh, probably state and federal law unless there were certain steps taken. And so right here, what we're doing is that we're dealing with a proposal to alter the, the framework that regulates gaming to enable the tribes to, to essentially exercise authorities that they don't currently have. Um, so it's, it, it's, it, this is definitely, a, a, would be a change in how gaming is regulated within the state because you would have uh, tribal nations regulating it alongside the state. And, and that, that's a change. So um, you know, that's why it's in here. Right, and okay. attorney, oh, sorry. And so no, that's okay, Mr. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> you go, because I have I, another question. So. Yeah, I was just gonna <laughs> clarify. So this essentially says that gaming only applying this, the, the, the laws of the state do not apply for gaming operations because you'd follow the federal laws from IGRA. Under our current gaming laws, casinos are illegal with the exception of two that came about by the citizens referendum process. So the only, our laws are prohibitive to just two casinos. So this would um, say that you would be governed under the IGRA essentially. Exactly, IGRA and also the applicable, you know, state regulatory baselines, which are all laid out in state law. Okay, uh, sorry, Representative. I have one, 
Yeah. That's okay. No, no, that's perfectly okay. I just know we did a lot of work or conversation in the 129th in regards to the tribes and gaming. So with that in my mind from last session, would this amendment to the settlement agreement that was made by forefathers open up the opportunity for the tribes to open a casino? And if it does open that opportunity up, are the tribes willing to have the process that Oxford and Bangor had to go through to open theirs up, which meaning the referendum, number one, number two, all the fees and license costs that those two casinos had to pay, is the tribes willing to go through the same process Thank you. I'll, I'll answer that in part and then I'll turn it over to Chief Francis because I think what you're touching on is on some level a, a tribal leader um, uh, level issue. But uh, essentially to answer the first part, yes, this, this amendment would authorize the, uh, the tribal nations in Maine to, uh, to open casinos, just like the ones that exist elsewhere, it creates the path for that to happen at least. Um, and, and as a part of that, the tribes would, uh, if there's going to be a class three gaming operation, expect to be dealing with, you know, state licensing and, and all those issues to the extent required in a compact and in this amendment. I'd say that class three gaming compacts, they very frequently require state licenses um, to be alongside a tribal license. So, you know, I think to, to answer your question in part, um, there is potential for, for many of the same sort of regulatory controls, whether it's fees or other issues to be applicable to these grime, tribal gaming facilities. It comes down to whether or not um, the state of Maine would want to negotiate that agreement with the tribes. That's really the big question. Um, if the state, if the governor, if this was enacted and there was no compact ever executed, um, then then it, it's tough to say how those issues would play out. That's why the compact exists. But I will defer to Chief Francis on the, on the other question of, you know, whether the tribes would be willing to pursue the path that the other commercial casinos follow. Thank you. Thanks, Corey. I, I, um, I think the purpose of the bill and uh, the overall work group was to restore the rights and privileges of tribes um, that exist under federal Indian law, um, and how do we make that uh, that paradigm work in Maine in a coexisting way with the state? So we have. Um, so to answer your question, I think what we're looking to do here is through that tribal recognition process um, that IGRA would lay out the structure and the process for how state interests and tribal interests both get uh, mitigated in that process. So to fees and all that other stuff, that gets negotiated in the compact. And you would have, you know, the state would have a strong people on their side negotiating that, et cetera. Um, it's not uncommon if you look across the country, and I know Allison and others can explain this better than me, but um, there are uh, commercial and uh, tribal casinos that coexist in states all across the country uh, with much different processes to the finish line on those. So um, I would say that this process would be different than what would be expected. Um, the outcomes would probably be very similar um, because the state would be negotiating those terms as well on their side. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, I don't think, um, and I'll speak for Penobscot, uh, our understanding of what we're trying to accomplish here is a path forward for the tribes and the states to work together in a government-to-government -government way that recognizes and restores the rights of the tribes um, for governmental businesses. Um, we're not commercial entities. So that is, um, I would see those processes as two very different processes. I'll follow up to what yep. the chief said. Um, I understand that, but I feel personally that if you want to open another casino in the state, that even though 
we're talking tribal gaming, you should, they, your tribes or the tribes should go through the same process that our other two casinos went through. And there shouldn't be a negotiating type thing. And I'm sorry if that's offensive, but I don't want to single out any unfairness to the ones we have, if you can understand that. And then my other concern is that um, Representative Kazel said was the revenue sharing. You guys keep talking about negotiating, um, which sends up a red flag to me because fair is fair. Rather you're a tribal gaming facility or a commercial one. In the state of Maine, casino's a casino. And I don't want to be unfair for the process that the other two casinos have had to go through. Now, if you're willing to go through the whole process that the other two do, the fees that were attached to their licenses and, and getting set up and et cetera, and everything that goes along with it, then I'm okay with it. But if you're still gonna leave this on the table as everything's gonna be negotiated, I can't support this, I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Okay, um, so we have a, Attorney uh, Benny um, is with us as well. And um, would you like to, to comment on that or anything? Sorry, we've got it. Yeah. Yeah, though, I think Representative Dolph, I was just gonna add, but I think, you, I think you're, you understand it, the process now. The only thing I was gonna do is just clarify a few things that, um, you know, before the settlement acts were, were put into law, um, Penobscot Nation was conducting gaming, if, as Chief Francis said. They did not think they negotiated that right away. Um, they thought they preserved that right. And so they were actually super surprised when a year after the settlement acts were enacted, the state basically came in and said you had to shut down because gaming is not allowed pursuant to state law. Um, so in their mind, it really is about this bill is about restoring back to them a right that they never understood that they, they gave up. Um, the framework that attorney Hinton's been trying to um, describe is the framework that applies to every other tribe in, in the country um, outside of Maine. So it really is um, the Federal Indian Gaming Regulatory Act really sets forth uh, three classes of gaming. You know, class one is traditional tribal gaming, which um, most people, you know, don't care about. Class two is bingo, game similar to bingo. And class three is the Las Vegas uh, gaming. And so the bill's really trying to allow the main tribes to conduct gaming if they choose to in a manner similar to every other federally recognized Indian tribe in the country. So with respect to class two, which is bingo, game similar to that, under the general federal Indian law, the, the tribes and the federal government regulate that. Um, it's tribal law and federal law that applies to, to that. So um, there are licensing requirements, health and safety requirements, but it's just tribal law and federal law that governs that. In this amendment, out of respect for the state government, the tribes agree in this amendment that um, their tribal laws will be no less rigu rigorous, rigorous than state law. So they're basically saying that they will essentially adopt state, state law. And that's essentially what Penobscot normally does with their tribal laws is they use state laws as a baseline and they usually tweak it as needed to accommodate some, some tribal cultural components or customs and traditions. With so that's how it works under bingo. So there would definitely be licensing and all of that, um, but it would be based through tribal and, and federal law. Um, there's a federal agency, the National Indian Gaming Commission that oversees class, class two tribal gaming. Um, and so the tribes would be subject to regulation by that federal entity as well, just like every other uh, tribe in the country. So on class three, which is the Las Vegas style gaming, which is what the other two casinos do, it, you are correct in that it would, most of that gets negotiated with the state. That's how the, the federal Indian law regime works. Um, so all aspects get negotiated between the tribe and the state. 
um, the tribes don't go through referendums. It's really up to the governor of the state to advocate whatever he or she, in this case, she thinks that the, the voters would, would want to negotiate. But, but that is done in a, in a gaming compact. So I just wanted to, to clarify those few things for you. Thank you. Thank you. Attorney, Attorney Benny. Um, I know Chief uh, Peter Paul would also uh, like to speak. Um, if you're able to turn on your screen or unmute. Um, and I'm not sure which name I guess regist is registered for uh, Chief Sabatis, um, but if you can write it into the chat, I can. I know if it's in a different computer, it may log you in in a different name. So, good morning. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Good morning. Uh, good morning, committee members. Um, we only recently found out that the uh, LD five five four, as written, would not include the Micmac Nation, and this is something that we would like. You know. Um, to be addressed by hopefully this process. Uh, we do support any legislation that um, includes beneficial acts for Indians. We think it would be a, a great step for, you know, all the Wabanaki tribes to uh, uh, benefit from any of these, any of this legislation that um, is for our tribes. And that's one reason why we do support it um, because it is promoting, you know, tribal sovereignty. It's a way for us to take care of our tribes, uh, you know, not not to be a burden on the state or anybody else. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's a way for us to, uh, you know, provide some income for ourselves. So uh, we would like to be included in the legislation if that's possible. And uh, I believe... Craig Sanborn has submitted some some language that would help with that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Chief, and thank you for being here. I think that is um, that's something we can certainly look at. I think my intention today, and obviously it's the discretion of the committee, was just to keep uh, this discussion going, keep going over the issues, and um, uh, keep working it. Probably next week. I mean. At, We've requested permission to meet for the committee's knowledge. I did, at the start of the meeting, I hadn't heard yet <laughs> if we'd been approved, okay. but I assume that we will. And I think this is something that we can certainly happy to look at including, so. Great, thank you. Okay. I think, I think one other thing, Mr. Chairman, just quickly um, to note is while these processes are very different, um, and again, it gets back to where governments and not corporations and these functions do not exist um, outside of tribal land. So what we're talking about here is a tribal right to develop economic opportunities within the tribal government's authority and, and territory. We're not talking about, um, you know, just popping a, a facility up anywhere in the state and, um, and, and so, so I think that distinction needs to be made too, that uh, the tribes, um, are, are, it's really a function of, of a sovereign government. It's not, um, this is not about, um, you know, uh, some kind of a, a corporate build out, which, um, which we would understand um, the argument around fairness there. Uh, and this whole thing is, if there's been an inequity in fairness, uh, this subject for 40 years has been uh, the prime example of that, I think. And, and we're just trying to find a path forward that recognizes the tribe's ability to accomplish these things um, through its own governmental status and uh, in conjunction and working in cooperative with the state. So um, I want to thank you for allowing me some time today. And I know others want to speak as well. And um, I look forward to continuing to work with you all on this. Thanks, Chief. Yeah, I appreciate the, the comments from everybody um, today. And I, I believe we've brought in Chief Sabatis, perhaps under, if that's um, the screen, if not, actually, there's two. So we'll try to, we just want to make sure every, oh, here we go. Yeah, great. And I can welcome uh, Chief uh, Sabatis. 
Okay, great. I can fix the name thing. So, <laughs> yeah, great. Welcome. Oh no. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Yeah, now we can. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> great. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I, you know, I don't, I don't know that I have a lot to say that's different from, you know, what um, Corey and Chief Francis have been saying, but I, you know, I really see the tribes um, as much different than corporations or these entities that are doing gaming in the state right now. And I, I guess I just wanted to, to speak to that a little bit. Um, we are governments just like the state and the state has gaming. And I know I've said this in my testimony in the past um, to help supplement your budgets. We, we have no tax revenue. The state takes our tax revenue. We don't have that at all. Um, we, this would really supplement our own budgets with health care and social services, we're funded at about half of our need. So whatever we're doing is really to care for our people and our governments. So I don't see um, the casinos that are current, currently uh, doing business um, on the same level as apples and oranges in my point of view. So I, I don't really have a whole lot to add. I, I'll be on though. I'm sure that I'll have more later on in the conversation. Great uh, uh, for being here, and um, yeah, as I said, I think in any information that we need to to make uh, decisions, hopefully next week, you know, we can certainly gather whatever we can today. So, uh, Representative McCray, <clears throat> uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you everybody for being here. Um, I wanted to thank Representative Dola for bringing up fairness because. To me, this is very much about fairness and um, correcting some inequities that have been longstanding. So I think Chief, um, Chief Sabatis and, and um, Chief Francis set out the difference, corporation versus government, very well. And um, I think this is our opportunity to, to get to some fairness that has not been there. So thank you. Thanks. Um, Senator Hickman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I wanna thank all of the chiefs and attorneys here today from the tribes uh, to explain to a committee that's got a lot of new members on it, sort of where we have been and where we're trying to get to. And yes, I will reiterate what Representative McCraig said because you know, I've heard, I've heard the question about fairness, the issue of fairness every time this comes up. And I think what people are trying to make clear here is that the fairness that's the most important to consider isn't so much the fairness of the tribes to a, a relative to gaming to other casinos in the state of Maine. It is the fairness of the tribes relative to how every other tribe in the nation is treated by the governments that it is supposed to be in relationship to as a sovereign nation. And so it's clear to me that in Maine, tribal sovereignty is an aspiration, it is not a reality. And that's extremely unfair. And I hope that this committee can see that this is a way that tribal gaming is a way to get to tribal sovereignty. Because when you cannot take care of your own people economically, you are dependent upon some other entity to do so. And I don't think that anyone on this committee likes to promote dependence on the state, on social services for a self-sufficient community of people. And in this case, a tribal nation. And so I just hope that we can listen to the chiefs and the attorneys for the tribes and any of the tribes representatives who are speaking today or in the future, that the fairness that they seek is in relationship to all other tribes in the country. Maine is an outlier and it has caused almost irreparable harm, it seems, in the people of the tribal nations of this nation state and we need to fix that forthwith. 
Thank you, Senator. Um, Representative Dolliff. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I was just wondering, since it seems like we're gonna continue this conversation, um, they talk about tribes following federal law on the, your licenses and, and stuff like that. And I was wondering um, if we could get that information. So in fairness to see what the tribes need to do to become a, a casino or a gaming facility versus, um, because I will tell you when this has been a conversation for over a year with my constituents and they don't, they're not, you know, we don't, they didn't want Maine to become a Las Vegas. And I said, well, you won't with three, but um, their concern is how much revenue are we, the state gonna see? We're talking about Maine. And so they wanna see the fairness to them is of the fees, what they, how they can process it. Um, okay, if they have a right that they don't need to go to referendum, um, I can give them, you know, I'll give that, that's no problem there. But I want to see what the revenue sharing will be for the state. I'd like to see what the federal laws that they are talking about um, versus what, main law is do you understand that senator yeah <laughs> yes uh representative yeah i think we thank can thank you we can get a breakdown of information janet's kind of laid out a, a broad overview of the federal law um which governs gaming in every other state in the country and so uh where there's cl uh, class three uh, you know uh where this relationship happens um so we can Get that and and I believe the attorneys can also give us more specific information on on what happens under AGRA as well as the way the compact structures typically work um, and we can provide that yeah uh, attorney Hinton did, did you want to chime, chime in sure thank you very much uh, <laughs> mr. chair um, representative Doloff I, I just wanted to, to quickly um, highlight a, a couple of a couple of things um, so I, first of all, I think that uh, that Janet and 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 her office have done um, they've done a really great job on tracking and compiling um, federal Indian law materials going back a couple of years now, um, and so a lot of that information that you're looking for it's it's probably you know easily in the record. I'm sure it can be retrieved. The tribal attorneys we're, we're here to help you know build up that repository of information so that you have it. Um, but I just I just want to be really clear about um, the regulation of, of gaming. Um, the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, um, as Chief Francis said earlier, um, was enacted in response to state concerns that tribal gaming would be done in a manner that was um, contrary to state interests, both from an economic perspective, from a public health and safety perspective. Um, and from a regulatory perspective, even more broadly. And so the, the introductory paragraphs of the Federal Indian Gaming Regulatory Act make very clear what Congress's intent is. And the, the regulatory framework that you see that is executed and administered by the Federal National Indian Gaming Commission is specifically designed to ensure that tribal gaming operations are conducted in a way that's, that protects and is adequately protective of public health and safety. Um, the federal, uh, this, the NIGC, as we call it, the National Indian Gaming Commission, um, they actually have on their website, you can see it, the model laws that, um, that are put out and that tribes are encouraged to use to ensure that every aspect of tribal gaming um, is, is handled in an appropriate way. And, and these model documents are out there. Tribes need to create their own laws and must be consistent with federal law. And then they're all vetted by the federal government. So it's not as though a tribal government would be able to pass a law and then open a gaming facility. 
there is there is a federal federal regulatory process. The National Indian Gaming Commission, I have to imagine, is is quite a bit larger and better resourced probably than the state gaming regulatory body, um, the gambling control unit in the state. And so I would say that you know here we're looking at um, a regulatory framework that is extraordinarily robust. Um, and and you know you look around the country and there are examples of where the feds have come in and enforced their rules, mandated compliance, um, even closed gaming facilities when the public interests, both federal and state and tribal are not being adequately protected. So it is quite a robust framework and um, I look forward to helping uh, bring more information to this committee over the next few days and in the next. Thank you, attorney. I think that'd be super uh, helpful. And just from like a very high level overview, essentially under federal Indian gaming laws, if a state, as, as it pertains to casino gambling, under the federal uh, Indian gaming laws, if a state has casinos under IGRA, the tribes enter into compacts on how to um, how to, to work it out with the state, correct? With the exception yes. of Maine, where the, yeah. That's right. And, and it's important to keep in mind those classes of gaming that Allison mentioned. Class three gaming, um, where you see what, they, what we call Las Vegas style gaming, um, but only because you see the same kinds of games. Um, that is where you have specific agreements on all aspects of how the gaming facility is regulated. So that's done in, under tribal and federal law and state law. And there are always mechanisms in these compacts for parties that feel like their rights under the compacts are violated to you know, mediate those disputes, arbitrate and litigate those disputes. That's class three gaming. Um, there, you don't have to look too far to see that the value of class three gaming generally far outpasses the value of class two gaming. Um, and so generally speaking, there is an incentive for everyone to try to get to that compact so that the revenue to both governments is as high as possible. Um, but in the event that there's not a class three gaming compact, um, class two gaming would still be regulated under uh, everywhere else in Indian country would be regulated under the combination of state and, and tribal or sorry, federal and tribal law. Um, here with this legislation, we're ensuring that even in the class two context, where a state elsewhere in Indian country wouldn't be able to regulate, you will still have the same state regulatory rules as the backdrop. So that as it says in here, the rules that apply to, to, to tribal gaming facilities can be no less rigorous than corresponding state laws. So from a public safety perspective, from a public interest perspective, um, you're going to have equality. Um, that doesn't as much go to the you know, corporation versus government side of things, but from a regulatory perspective, we, we have been working with the AG's office to ensure that there is consistency and, and fairness in how these facilities are regulated. Chairman Chiazzo, sorry. Thank you, uh, Chairman Lucchini. And, and uh, uh, Attorney Hinton, maybe just to kind of um, re reclassify this a little bit. I mean, we're really just talking about this bill gives, gives the tribes and the executive the authority to negotiate a compact. It doesn't create the terms and conditions of that contract. That's what part of that negotiation would be, right? So some of the questions I think, if I recall from your previous testimony where we said, what are some of the details and what happens if an agreement is not reached? There are mechanisms in place to, to allow for um, uh, arbitration or something. It's not like we're saying, if we pass this bill, all of the tribes in Maine will automatically get the rights to a casino or a class three gaming. That's still a negotiation. This just authorizes the negotiation to take place. Is, is that fair? That's exactly right. Okay. Thank you. Um, attorney, attorney Benny, would you like to add? Yeah. Yeah, I was just going to add in that, um, you know, I represent Indian tribes across the country as, as a attorney Hinton and in states where there's both commercial gaming and tribal gaming that with respect to class three gaming, which is the Las Vegas style gaming that's governed by compact, it's typical for the tribes to just um, agree with the state and negotiate it into the compact that on licensing and things like that, the tribes just use the state mechanisms that are already in place for commercial gaming. And the tribes just 
you know, pay those fees to the state and do that because there's already a, a system in place that, that is common that, that for the compact purposes, those terms are just added into the compact for class three and the tribes just sort of follow that um, system in place. They always add protections, like making sure that their licenses and things like that get processed in the same time frame as any commercial, you know, casinos, because they want to make sure that there's no bias against the tribal casinos or favoritism play. But but just when there, I just wanted people to know when there's commercial and tribal um, facilities in the same state, um, those negotiations usually go a lot uh, quicker because there's already a, a commercial system in place. So the state already has an idea of how they want gaming done. Um, and that the negotiations really focus more on whether the tribes share a percentage of their revenue and what the state provides in exchange for that percentage of revenue. Oftentimes when I've dealt with this issue in other states, the, the issues of concerns of constituents comes up and you know, what are the benefits to constituents? And I would just reiterate what Chief Francis says, which is that when it comes to tribal gaming, um, every dollar stays in the state, none of it leaves. It's actually a requirement of Federal Indian Gaming Regulatory Act that the money stays um, you know, in the state to tribal government operations, tribal government services, and, and, the, and the federal government does um, monitor that, um, conduct audits. And, and so th those are really the benefits to constituents is all the money stays in the state, all the jobs stay in the state, they're tribal governments, so they're not going anyplace else. Um, the last thing I just would say, Chair, is that um, I wouldn't assume that if you do pass this bill and it gets enacted into law that the tribes conduct gaming. I you know, represent a lot of tribes and have been in this space for a long time. There are lots of tribes that have the right to game that don't do gaming. The market really dictates that. And so there are plenty of tribes I represent that have the right to conduct gaming that just don't because there's just not a market that supports that where they're located. Thank you, um, Attorney Benny. I, and I, I think that's one of the kind of fundamental points that, that you highlighted to me at least is that um, with this, with a tribal casino, that money stays locally. And uh, Attorney Hinton, I know we've talked before about some of the provisions of IGRA that even re restrict who can invest in a casino, correct? Under federal? That's exactly right. There's a, a really important rule in IGRA. It's called the sole proprietary interest rule. And it means that tribal nations must be the only owners of their casinos. Um, there is opportunity for, you know, advisors and, and companies to help facilitate the, the operation, but they can't own a casino. It can 100% own tribally. Um, and, and I just want to note that even though it's 100% tribally owned, um, and, and the majority of the revenues have to all be going back into the tribal communities. IGRA makes really clear that separate and apart from revenue sharing, tribal governments are still permitted to share revenues um, and to help local governments defray the costs of regulating gaming. And so it's very common um, for even class two facilities um, to, uh, to have agreements with local cities where a uh, high percentage of revenues are provided directly to cities. And I'll speak to the state of Indiana and the city of South Bend, where, um, where I, I was just assisting a client with the completion of a compact. We had a class two facility where I believe it was 1% of revenues go straight to the city. Um, and the state saw that. And you know, at the end of the day, there was, um, there was plenty of room for revenue to be shared more broadly with the state under a class three compact. So there's ample opportunity for local governments who directly benefit from all forms of tribal gaming. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I think that ownership thing is a big, is, is an important part that sometimes gets overlooked. And uh, Representative Supika. Thank you. Um, so I, I'm hearing a lot about this this concept of fairness and also, um, you know, constituents. And I, I represent a city that has a casino. Um, and I absolutely believe that the health and well being of the surrounding communities directly affect the health and well being of my city of Bangor. And I also believe that the health and well being of the tribes in Maine directly affect the health and well being of the city of Bangor. And I don't see this as unfair. 
Um, I, I'm actually really excited about it and I'm looking forward to the discussions going forward. And, and, I, and, I, and I see that it's very clear to me that tribes are not corporations. They're, 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 you know, they have their, their own form of government and they're, they're sovereign. And so um, I'm, I'm, I don't, I guess I have to do, be better at making a direct tabling motion, but I didn't know if we've come to the point where we want to consider tabling so that we can continue this discussion and get some more information um, or, or not. So I see Chiazzo has his finger up. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Representative. I think, yeah, we've had a good discussion and I think there is, especially uh, as Chief Peter Paul has um, offered some changes um, and I believe he said Mr. Sanborn may have some language that um, hopefully they can send over to the committee as well. And then we can continue to work um, with everybody on, on getting more language. Uh, Representative Chiazzo. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I was just gonna make that statement before the tabling kills all debate and discussion. So I just wanted to get that out first before we, 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 we made the motion uh, before, or before a motion was made, so. I will defer now to Representative Sapita. Motion to table. Second. Second. Okay, we have a motion to table and tabling of course is um, non-debatable. Um, so we have a motion to table and we will um, in just a second, proceed to a roll call, but I do want to thank everybody for participating uh, today. We really appreciate it. Um, Karen, uh, let me, one, two, three, six. Okay, we have a quorum present. So Karen, if you could please call the roll. Senator Lucchini. Yes. Senator Lucchini, yes. Senator Hickman. Yay. Senator Hickman, yay. Senator Farron. Senator Farron, absent. Representative Chiazzo. Yes. Representative Chiazzo, yes. Representative McCrate. Yes. Representative McCrate, yes. Representative Tuttle. Representative Tuttle, absent. Representative Riley. Representative Riley, absent. Representative Supika. Yes. Representative Supika, yes. Representative Wood. Yes. Representative Wood, yes. Representative Kinney. Yes. Representative Kinney, yes. Representative Harrington. Representative Harrington, absent. Representative Corey. Representative Corey, absent. Representative Dalla. Yes. Representative Dalla, yes. Eight in favor of the motion, zero opposed to the motion, and five members absent, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Karen. Um, I would also like to uh, uh, give permission to Senator Lucchini, uh, Janet, and the members of the tribes to, to work on that language um, uh, and, and hopefully have something ready for us um, rather soon. We're, we're running out of time, so the, the time is of the essence. So uh, I think it would be great for, for that, um, uh, that interested parties group to get together and work out uh, some language and some compromises or whatever needs to be in front of us so that we can we can take a vote on this uh, for sure in the next couple of days so so thank you okay. yeah thank you and, and again thanks to the tribal chiefs and the tribal attorneys for being here um, today uh, we greatly appreciate it so thank you thank you thanks thank you for having us thanks. and we'll work on those changes and and i apologize i do have to step into it uh, me the class of kids and I apologize I know people had requested the AG's office to be here and um, we didn't have I guess time to to get quite to all those before the tabling motion but it's something we can make available if uh, you know I apologize for them sitting in the waiting room and not getting their chance um, but we can work on that for next time so I'll turn it over to you Representative Chiazzo and if um, Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, if we could uh, move on to LD 1330. Uh, Janet, when, when you're ready. Sorry, I get the black flies are here too, apparently. Okay. 
Okay, radical change of topic. <laughs> it's what we do. So LD 1330 and LD 1330, excuse me, 1384 are both bills that essentially accomplished the same thing. So they would have made join the National Popular Vote Compact, which is an interstate compact, which is why the titles are slightly different, but the bills are identical as far as I can tell. So under both of the bills, they would propose to adopt the interstate compact to elect the president of the United States by national popular vote. Under that compact, which is set forth in the text of each of these bills, at least six days before the date that the presidential electors are, are set to meet to vote, the chief election official of each compact state would make a final determination of the number of popular votes cast in the state for each presidential slate and would then communicate that information to the chief election official in each other compact state. And then just um, for some background information, there's the federal law that sets the date that the presidential electors meet and cast their votes in December of the presidential election year. And in Maine, um, the secretary of state would be the chief election official. Okay, so then continuing on under the compact, the chief election official of each compact state must then determine the national popular vote total for each presidential slate. And the national popular vote total is determined by adding the total number of votes for each presidential candidate in each state of the United States and in the District of Columbia, regardless of whether those jurisdictions are part of the compact. So it really is the national popular vote, not just the compact state's popular vote. The appropriate official in each compact state would then certify the appointment of presidential electors in that state that are associated with a national popular vote winner. And just for your reference, in Maine, it's the governor who certifies the state's presidential electors. Under the compact, if there is a tie in the national popular vote, then each compact state certifies appointment of the presidential electors for the winner of the compact state's own popular vote. And then uh, under the compact, the way it's written, it would be effective and would govern the appointment of presidential electors in any presidential election year in which the compact has been enacted in substantially the same form by July 20th in states cumulatively possessing a majority of the electoral votes. So just as some background, there are currently 538 electoral votes, 535 for the states across the country and three for the District of Columbia. And so the compact would take effect when enacted enacted and effective in states possessing 270 electoral votes to thereby be the majority. States may withdraw from the compact at any time. However, under the compact, a withdrawal that is less than six months before the end of a presidential term is not effective until after the next presidential election. In addition, both bills would repeal section 801, subsection two of title 21A, which currently provides that at the general election, the counting of ballots for candidates for president must proceed according to the ranked choice method of counting votes. So that's in section one of each bill. At the public hearing, the Secretary of State proposed amending either or both bills to retain the use of ranked choice voting in general elections for US president in Maine. This proposed amendment would um, comport with the majority amendment to LD 1363, which includes the Secretary of State's proposal to amend the provisional law that talks about the governor certifying who the presidential electors are. And as you can see in the language, which was voted in by a majority of the committee, the governor would then be certifying the final um, round votes for each presidential slate, as opposed to the first round votes that were cast because Maine does have other laws that provide for ranked choice voting. So if you go for the secretary of state's amendment, that would comply. Um, I updated, um, this bill has come before us in the past and the number of states that have enacted the compact have changed. So this is an update from um, NCSL on the different states that have uh, adopted the compact. And so they're now up to a total of 196 electoral votes. And if states worth 74 electoral votes worth um, adopt the compact, then it will take effect in the states that have adopted it. I did not um, update these numbers to reflect the new census counts. So this 
these numbers may slightly change. I didn't look into that. Um, I guess we can if you want me to. So um, just as background, because this issue has arisen in the past, is this constitutional or not? So Article 2, Section 1 of the U.S. Constitution, which establishes the Electoral College, directs that each state shall appoint in such manner as the legislature thereof may direct a number of electors, and then it's, um, and those are electors for U.S. president, and then it explains that you get the number of electors that um, are equivalent to the number of senators and representatives that you have in each state. And then just to be clear, the 23rd Amendment to the U.S. Constitution does give Washington, D.C. the power to have three presidential electors. So the italicized language above is what um, the proponents of the compact say gives the legislature the authority to decide how it's going to determine who its electors are. And um, the proponents of the compact believe that this language allows the legislature to decide that it, its electors will go with the national popular vote as opposed to the state vote. Um, there's no definitive case law on that, but that is the language they're relying on. Um, there have been, uh, there were very few this time, but there were some statements in the testimony that perhaps this compact might violate the compact clause of the constitution. So under Article 1, Section 10, Clause 3 of the U.S. Constitution, which is known as the Compact Clause, no state shall, without the consent of Congress, lay any duty of tonnage, please don't ask me what that is, keep troops or ships of war in time of peace, or enter into any agreement or compact with another state. Um, and then it goes on. So the compact clause says in its plain language that no state shall enter any compact with another state without the consent of Congress. So what does that mean? The United States Supreme Court has interpreted this clause as quote, limited to agreements that are directed to the formation of any combination tending to increase the political power of the states, which may encroach upon or interfere with the just supremacy of the United States. And that's from a 1978 case which was about a multi-state tax um, compact. Put differently, only state compacts that would quote, authorize the member states to exercise any powers belonging to the federal government that they could not exercise in the absence of the compact and that are adopted without congressional consent will be held to violate the compact clause. Um, as I interpret the compact, I don't see a strong argument that it aggrandizes the power of the states vis-a-vis -vis the federal government. I suppose that argument could be made, but that's what the test would be, is does the compact increase the state's power um, versus the federal government? And if it does, then the consent of Congress is needed. There are some technical issues. First of all, if you enact the bills as written, and so therefore um, repeal ranked choice voting for general elections for US president, there's another section of law that you may wanna consider also repealing. And that's um, a section we talked about actually last week in the Secretary of State's bill. So the definition of elections determined by ranked choice voting currently includes general elections for presidential electors. And so it might make sense to clean up the statute by removing that paragraph as well, if um, you are gonna go forward with these bills which repeal ranked choice voting for presidential elections. If that um, is something the committee is interested in moving forward with, it would conflict with a provision of LD 1363, which is quoted above in the bill analysis, um, or at least the majority amendment to 1363, which does talk about the governor certifying the electors based on the final round of ranked choice voting tabulation. If alternatively, um, the committee uh, wants to move forward with the Secretary of State's proposed amendment to these bills, which would retain ranked choice voting in Maine for general elections for the US president, um, the committee may wish to consider defining the phrase number of popular votes as that phrase is used in the fourth paragraph of section 1302, which is on page one lines 37 to 37A to the bill. Why am I saying this? Well, that phrase describes the official vote total that must be communicated to the chief election officials of other member states as the final result of um, the general election for US president. It may be helpful to specify in a definition that for purposes of Maine's general elections for US president, the number of popular votes 
would in fact be the number of final round votes received by each presidential slate and not the number of first round votes cast for that presidential, those presidential slates in Maine. Um, there's no real definition of popular votes in a compact and um, it just may be helpful to clarify what it is that the sheep election official is going to be telling the other states to include in their national popular vote calculation. Um, as far as a tie in the national popular vote, the compact um, does state that if there's a tie, each state would then default to uh, nominating presidential electors that comport with the state's own um, popular vote. And under the bills as drafted, um, section two of each bill does require that the electors be the ones that comport with the national popular vote. There's no backup provision that talks about what happens if there's a tie. And so you may wanna consider making a backup provision because if there is no back national popular vote winner because there is a tie, there would be a void in the law about who would Maine be nominating as its electors. And then as far as fiscal information, we don't have a preliminary fiscal impact statement, but um, LD 816, which was the national popular vote bill and the 129th legislature did have no fiscal impact. So it's possible, although not 100% certain that that could happen again if you move forward with this bill or either of these bills. Thank you, Janet. Uh, any questions or comments from the committee? All right, um, I guess maybe I'll go. I'm, I'm not, not, you know, timing is everything with, with bills like this. And I'm, I'm not sure if, um, I think we've heard from a couple of, of different interested parties that maybe this isn't, maybe it's the right bill, just maybe not the right time for it. Um, and, and so, um, I'm a little hesitant to, to move forward. Um, first of all, we don't have a quorum. <laughs> Second of all, we do have Senator Hickman, which is always appreciated. Um, uh, so we really can't make any motions yet. So maybe when we can get, there's Representative Dolliff. Thank you. One, two, three, four. And we just need either Representative Kenny or I can snag um, Representative, uh, sorry, Senator Lucchini. Um, does anybody have any comments or concerns or questions about the analysis or the bills that are in front of us? Uh, Representative McCray. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, I've been getting communication that the timing isn't right. Um, I support the, the concept. Um, definitely, but with the timing not being right, I think I think we can't go forward, in my opinion. But I think Representative Wood was going to speak as well, so I'll stop. Representative Wood. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was just going to say that um, I feel very strongly that the system that we currently have in this country is broken and needs to be fixed. And I have spoken with many people about the national popular vote and I'm not sure if it's the final answer, but I think that the conversation is a very good conversation worth having because I, I firmly believe that we need to do something. And um, I also understand that right now is probably not not the right year for us to bring this forward in Maine. And for me personally, that gives me more time to talk with more people um, and come up with what's the best plan um, for the change. And, and maybe this is it, um, but I feel like having more conversation about it is worthwhile. So um, once we have a quorum, I, I'm in favor of, um, not putting this through today. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Wood. Yeah, and you know, I would agree. I think rank, you know, the rank choice voting piece that's come into it as well. I thought was 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 interesting. 
Um, and I, I guess I haven't taken into account really how that would play into the, the voting portion of it and how that might affect the compact or something. So I think, uh, I think you know, we probably should take a little bit more time and, and, and uh, uh, review and see what the best path forward might be for sure. Uh, Representative Kinney. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I pulled over so that I could turn on video. So um, I'll make a motion not, not to pass. Thank you, Representative Kinney. And Senator Hickman was there right on cue. So I appreciate that. Um, is there a second? Second. I'll second. All right. Uh, so uh, motion is ought not to pass by Representative Kinney, seconded by Representative Wood. Karen, before we lose anybody, please call the roll. <laughs> And this is for LV 1330, correct? Correct. Okay. Senator Lucchini. Senator Lucchini, absent. Senator Hickman. Yay. Senator Hickman, yay. Senator Farron. Senator Farron, absent. Representative Chiazzo. Yes. Representative Chiazzo, yes. Representative McCrae. Yes. Representative McCrae, yes. Representative Tuttle. Representative Tuttle, absent. Representative Riley. Representative Riley, absent. Representative Supika. Yes. Representative Supika, yes. Representative Wood. Yes. Representative Wood, yes. Representative Kinney. Yes. Representative Kinney, yes. Representative Harrington. Representative Harrington, absent. Representative Corey. Representative Corey, absent. Representative Dollar. Yes. Representative Dollar. Yes. Seven in favor of the motion, zero opposed to the motion, and six members absent, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Karen. So the motion ought not to pass prevails with the majority of those present. Uh, those who are absent have until noon tomorrow to cast their vote. Uh, and then now we've got one, two, three, four, five, four, Here. five. I need one more, and then we can we can make a motion on LB thirteen eighty four. One, two. Representative Kinney, your hand is up, but your video's off. There you are. Thank you. Uh, can we, today, huh? Mr. I, I know, right? It's crazy today. Uh, <laughs> could we have a motion on 1384 from somebody, please? I move on. Not to I'll pass. move on. Not, I'll second. <laughs> okay, so motion by, by Senator Hickman, seconded by Representative Kinney. Um, Karen, as fast as you can, please call the roll. <laughs> Senator Lucchini. Uh, we'll come back to Senator Lucchini. Lucchini. Uh, Senator oh, Hickman. Oh, yes. there he is. Uh, Senator Lucchini. Sorry, Karen. That's okay. I'll vote yes. Thank Senator you. Senator Lucchini, yes. Senator Hickman. Yay. Senator Hickman, yay. Senator Farron. Senator Farron, absent. Representative Chiazzo. Yes. Representative Chiazzo, yes. Representative McCray. Yes. Representative McCray, yes. Representative Tuttle. Representative Tuttle, absent. Representative Riley. Representative Riley, absent. Representative Tupika. Yes. Representative Tupika, yes. Representative Wood. Yes. Representative Wood, yes. Representative Kinney. Yes. Representative Kinney, yes. Representative Harrington. Representative Harrington, absent. Representative Corey. Representative Corey, absent. Representative Dollar. Yes. Representative Dollar, yes. Eight in favor of the motion, zero opposed to the motion, and five members absent, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Karen. So with the majority of those present, the ought not to pass motion is successful. The five absentees will have until noon tomorrow to cast their vote. Thank you, everybody, for playing musical chairs to get those votes accomplished. Much appreciated. Mr. Chair. Representative McCrate. I think Senator Hickman was first. Oh, sorry, I can't see your hand, Senator Hickman. It blends in with your background perfectly. So I apologize for that. Senator Hickman. 
It's not a problem. I didn't want to say anything before we voted because I knew that we were fast, had to be fast in case <laughs> someone's driving. Um, you know, I wanted to say that I have supported this in the past. I definitely believe that we need a federal voting rights act to improve some of the things that seem to be happening across the country. I will say that, you know, I have always taken the opportunity to vote for something that whittles away at the legacy of slavery, which we have discussed around these issues in the past. But I will say when we talk about timing, there is a time for everything. And it's very clear to me right now that even if Maine were to adopt this bill to become a part of this compact, it's not going to go into effect until some future time. And that means it's not going to impact the lives of Mainers today. And we know that our lives have been impacted in many ways that don't have anything to do with, in Maine, thankfully, this issue. It is a divisive issue, clearly. We have our two electoral votes split by district, two of them rather, uh, one split by district over congressional districts. And that is an improvement upon winner take all. That actually muddied the field when it came to this bill, when it first was introduced years ago. Now we have ranked choice voting, which further muddles the field. And we have a landscape where people don't trust the outcomes of elections in other states for better or for worse, right or wrong. And I just don't see the reason now why this would be a good idea because it will not directly impact the people of the state. And it's far too divisive for there to be any more debate on this outside of committee. And so I think that we have done the best for the people of the state and for the politics of the state by setting this aside this time around and maybe revisiting it in the future. I just wanted to be on record saying that for those who know that I have supported this in the past and that's why I'm not supporting it today. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Hickman. Uh, very well said, of course, as always. Representative McCrate. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, ditto and <laughs> I can't, hard to follow Senator Hickman. Um, I, I was going to suggest that I'm sure something will come in the future and Janet's an analysis would be incredibly helpful to anyone who does want to look to put this forward in the future because it points out some of the things that we need to um, adjust because things have changed, as Senator Hickman said. Um, and again, well said, Senator Hickman. Thank you, Representative McCray. Uh, any other questions? I think Senator Hickman's hand is still up from the last time, but he's off camera, so I will wait for a second. Oh, and then it's down. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, and I guess, so Janet, if we're ready, um, we could move on to uh, LD 1621, which is uh, an act to reform payments to legislators and political action committees from Senator Maxman. Yes, and we already had a work session on this and there was some um, interest expressed in knowing sort of what to do with different issues mm -hmm. that um, I think I caused all that trouble by pointing out in the bill analysis. But then there were also some ideas maybe about mileage reimbursement versus the way that the bill was written about sort of um, fuel costs. And if you remember last time I asked if anybody had an idea for proposing an amendment, because I just wanted it to be clear, I can't do that, um, that they contact me and Senator Hickman said to everybody that he asked the sponsor to. And so she has um, drafted an amendment and she did authorize me to share it with you. Um, so I don't know if you want to talk about that, if that's appropriate now or not. Yeah, I think that would be helpful, um, just to kind of give us an update of, of what issues made it through and into the amendment. I think that would be great. Thank you. And Senator Maxman is in the waiting room. If we did have questions for her, we could bring her in as well. So um, this looks similar in structure to the bill, but it is a strike and replace. It's slightly reorganized. Um, and that is because of addressing the penalty provisions that were discussed last time. So the way that it's written now, 
um, subsection one is going to talk about payments to legislators specifically, but all of the provisions of the bill, you'll see the first thing right off the bat that you'll see is differently is that it includes a political action committee or ballot question committee. If the legislator similar to the bill is a principal officer, treasurer, or one of the individuals primarily responsible for raising contributions or making decisions. So it's going to apply to both types of committees. And so um, with that change, if you um, favored that, it wouldn't matter whether the other bill that's um, going forth, um, 1485, whether that ethics commission bill passes or not, because if you, if you use this language that it applies to both types of committees, it won't matter how you re redefine those committees, it's still gonna include all the same groups of committees, if that makes any sense. Um, so except as provided in the paragraphs below, the general rule would be, which is similar to the rule in current law, that the committee may not compensate the legislator for services provided to the committee. The exceptions are that the committee may pay for or reimburse the legislator for travel expenses, excuse me, expenses incurred in the proper performance of the legislator's legislative duties and in volunteering for the committee. If the legislator uses the legislator's vehicle, then the committee may pay the legislator mileage reimbursement at a rate established by the commission by rule, but may not pay for or reimburse the legislator for the direct costs of repairing or maintaining the legislator's vehicle. So there are two separate sentences here. The first one is the general authority to pay for travel expenses for either purpose, either the performance of the legislator's duties as a legislator or for volunteering for the committee. And that's more open-ended. So that I think was the sponsor's attempt to address the idea of like traveling to conferences and by plane and train and all the hotel rooms and things like that. And then the second sentence says, for those same purposes, if you're using your own vehicle, then we're going to a mileage reimbursement type of reimbursement as opposed to directly paying different types of maintenance costs. Um, the next paragraph talks about the committee being able to pay for or reimburse the legislator for other expenses incurred in the proper performance of the legislator's legislative duties and for purchases made by the legislator on behalf of the committee. This is current law. Um, and then it's just, it was also in the bill, but you may remember that the bill also had another phrase about travel expenses here. So it wasn't clear how it related to the paragraph above. So that's just removed. And so paragraph B is now gonna control all types of travel expenses. Paragraph D now says the committee may not pay for or reimburse the legislator for any expenses that have been or will be paid for or reimbursed by the legislature or any other source of payment or reimbursement. This is um, part of the bill and it's not clear in current law, although it may be the intent of current law. So this is the same as the bill. Um, and then paragraph E says the committee may not make any payments for or reimburse the legislator for any expenses that are determined by the commission to be for the purpose of personal financial enrichment of the legislator. Again, that's in the bill and it's in current law as well. Then the next um, subsection is gonna focus on payments to others. So not directly to the legislator themselves. So again, it applies to both political action committees and ballot question committees when the legislator is the treasurer or principal officer primarily responsible for contribution raising or decision making. So in those instances, the committee may not compensate an immediate family member of the legislator for services provided to the committee. This was in the bill. This is a change from current law. Um, it's just now in a new place in the bill. Um, paragraph B is the committee may not make payments to or distribute loan advance deposit or give money or anything of value to or compensate a business owned or operated by the legislator. So that one who's involved in the PAC or the ballot question committee or an immediate family member of the legislator. So as, as long as you end with the word legislator here, this is current law. The bill expanded that to businesses that are owned by an immediate family member of the legislator. And so this amendment keeps that expansion, but again, it's reorganizing it into a new place for purposes of dealing with the penalties below. And, and Janet, I think we had this discussion privately. Immediate family member is defined in statute, right? There's a list Correct. of all of the, okay. Correct. It's, it's defined generally for all of the election laws, and that definition applies here and includes all those members like stepmothers and stepbrothers and, and include domestic partners as well. Yeah. Thank you. 
paragraph C um, says the committee may not make any payments for or reimburse an immediate family member of the legislator for any expenses that are determined by the commission to be for the purposes of personal financial enrichment of that immediate family member. This is in the bill. This is not in current law. Current law only has this provision regarding payments to the legislator that are for their personal enrichment. So that was a, a way that the bill would have expanded the law and it's retained in this amendment, but again, just in a new location. Commingling of funds is prohibited in current law um, more narrowly than in the bill. And this um, amendment keeps the language from the bill, but again, puts it in a new place. So it says if a legislator, again, is involved in a ballot question committee or political action committee as one of those four um, leadership positions, then the committee's funds may not be commingled with the personal funds of the legislator. That's where current law ends. And then in the bill and in the amendment, it says, or commingled with the funds of a business owned or operated by the legislator or any other person. As far as penalties, so if um, you look above, if the committee violates any of the provisions above, so if the committee violates any of the provisions about payments to a legislator in subsection one, payments to businesses or family members in subsection two or any commingling of funds, then the committee commits a civil, civil violation <clears throat> for which a fine of not more than $500 or the amount of the impermissible payment or reimbursement, whichever is greater can be imposed and it's imposed by the commission. And then this language here is just talking about the investigation and all the procedures that apply generally. I think they would apply anyway, but it's just adding clarity to how that um, penalty would be imposed. And then as far as the legislator, if they accept a payment or reimbursement from a committee that's prohibited by subsection one, or if they violate subsection three about commingling their funds, then they've committed a civil violation again for the $500 or the maximum or the greater amount of the impermissible payment or reimbursement. Um, and this is a discretionary fine amount. So it's, it's a fine of not more than that. So the ethics commission would have the ability to determine whether to impose a lower fine amount or what to do in those circumstances. And as far as payments to the legislator or the commingling of funds, you'll see that both the committee or the legislator could be on the hook for those. And that would be something that the ethics commission would determine. Um, they could um, move for both to pay penalties or they might decide that one is more responsible than the other in the particular circumstances of that case. So this gives the, some flexibility. there. But what it does take away, what is different from the bill is these prohibitions here about payments to family members and businesses. The legislator themselves is not on the hook for that. It's just the committee. So it's up to you if that's something you like. And then the rulemaking provision is slightly rewritten to clarify that the commission establishes the mileage reimbursement rate as in the bill, they establish record keeping requirements and reporting requirements, and then a, a little bit clearer about rules related to reimbursable travel expenses, because remember, other than the use of the own vehicle, it's sort of open ended that travel expenses can be reimbursed. So this gives the commission the authority if they feel like there needs to be some way to cabin those off that they could do so, but it's may they don't have to. And those would be routine technical rules. All right. Thank you, Janet. Uh, Senator Hickman, I did see your hand that time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm wondering if uh, the bill sponsor would be amenable to a slight amendment to the section around the mileage reimbursement. I like to put certain things in statute and leave certain things to rule. And I think that it might make sense to take some of the rulemaking off of the commission and just put into statute that the reimbursable rate for mileage should be up to or equal to the federal mileage rate as established by the Internal Revenue Service, because that's currently what is the understood rate you can reimburse yourself for if you use your vehicle for this purpose. So if we just put that in statute, we don't have to worry about rulemaking and it's clear for anyone to see, you cannot reimburse yourself beyond the federal rate. Anything up to that is fine, but you can't go above that. And I, if we put that in the law, 
I think that might make sense, but you know, that's an opinion, a suggestion. Okay. Thank you, Senator Hickman. Uh, uh, Janet, you wanted to? I didn't catch who sets the federal mileage reimbursement rate, but I would just flag as an issue. It's always an issue when the main legislature says that it's up to the federal government to establish the provisions of law. I understand we were talking about that in the context of tribal gaming, but that is a completely different context where yeah. federal law generally does control and we're in a weird situation in Maine with the Settlement Act and everything. But generally speaking, there's a delegation issue. If the Maine legislature says that the federal government can decide what the rules are, it doesn't mean you can't do it. Um, and maybe nobody would challenge it. And even if it was challenged, maybe somebody would say, well, that's narrow enough, it's fine. But I just wanna flag that for you that generally speaking, that's not something that the legislature usually does because it's a delegation issue. And do we, def if we say, uh, whatever the published federal rate is at the time, that's still delegating that authority to the feds to do that? If you say that it's the federal late as, rate as of date X, then that's not a delegation because you're picking a specific number. But it's when you say that when the federal government changes it, it changes for Maine, that starts getting into a murky area. Um, but I don't know if you want to fix it. If you allow the ethics commission to make that you've, I know it seems odd, but you've delegated to the ethics commission the authority, but you've set some parameters and then they can adopt that federal rate. I know that that sounds very strange, but it is viewed slightly differently. That's fine then. I then leave it the way that it is because the ethics commission could do the same thing and we won't have the delegation issue. We refer to federal statutes when they are downloaded into ours for the purposes of policy. That's true with food. Uh, everywhere in Title 22. We we're referring to federal acts all the time. Um, and so I know that's slightly different than setting a rate for something. So I, I'm pretty sure that's different than that. But that's why I was thinking, but if it doesn't work, then we don't- we it, can it might be okay. It's just being cautious to yeah. let you- That's fine. The rulemaking is there, so they can do it that way. I just wanted to put something in statute, but if it makes better sense to not sort of play with that delegation issue, then we can leave it alone. Leave it as is. Right. Are you good, Janet? I I'm good with whatever you want to do. All right. <laughs> so it sounds like we're going to leave it as is. We'll just leave that. We'll defer to ethics and let them, you know, um, use the federal rate if they, if they so choose. Yep. Okay. Uh, Representative Dolliff. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I really hate limiting it to so-called family members because the courts don't really see like boyfriend and girlfriend could live together for three to five years, but in the court's eyes, they don't have any right. But unless they're married, you know, but just by saying for family members, I think we need to extend it to significant others or boyfriend, girlfriend, because there's a roundabout way to pay somebody. I feel this isn't, there's a back door here. And if we're gonna close the door, let's close it on. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Dolliff. Um, does anybody wanna respond to that? Representative McCray. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, I think that's a good question, but I, my understanding was what's in law now that Janet has referenced covers all of that, but could I ask Janet that question? We I'm looked at that last right time. Now. Yeah, thanks. So this is the immediate family member definition. So it includes the spouse, parent, grandparent, child, grandchild, sister, half-sister, brother, half-brother, step-parent, step-grandparent, step-child, step-grandchild, step-sister, step-brother, mother-in-law and father-in-law, brother-in-law and sister-in-law, son-in-law and daughter-in-law, guardian, former guardian, domestic partner, half-brother or half-sister of a person's spouse, or the spouse of a person's half-brother or half-sister. 
So domestic partners would include it. I don't know off the top of my head the definition of domestic partner. Um, someone else may. I will say that if you want to move into other household members, um, it might be better to write it sort of the way the sports betting bills are written, which is individuals living in the same household. Um, if you talk about boyfriend and girlfriend, then um, you need to be very specific about what that means. So like in the protection from abuse laws, they talk about being a sexual partner. Um, is it enough if you've just been on one date or not? So that's the route they take is talk about the level of intimacy in the couple. Um, so you would just need to be very specific so that we can draft it to capture who you want to capture. Senator Hickman. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I would love to have been a part of the conversation that came up with that list. <laughs> because of the time. <laughs> Um, I certainly understand what Representative Doloff is saying, but I think that I might be amenable to changing the definition, amending that definition to include, you know, members of your household. But to try to determine what a friend is, or a girlfriend, or a boyfriend, or a significant other, really does have to do with intimacy. And I don't know if this is the part of the law where we want to be talking about intimacy. Um, Obviously, in some other parts of the law, it makes sense. I just don't know if we need to go down that road here. But I would certainly be willing to expand the definition of immediate family to include members of the household. Yeah. And even that may need to be further defined. Like, I don't even know, it, it, you know, I guess anyone who lives in your house for any period of time is a member of your household. And if they're living with you while you are a principal of a PAC, or ballot question committee, you probably ought not be paying them for services rendered to the PAC or the ballot question committee. I, I think that's what Representative Dolph is getting at, yeah. but I don't know about like, if we're talking about somebody that lives five miles down the road who you've had a relationship with in the past, do they still count in this scenario? I don't want it to be, shall we say, too broad. Yeah, for me, that's a slippery slope too, because if you have, if you have people from, let's say, volunteers out of state and they're, they're, you're boarding them, does that count as living in your house, even though there's no, there's no, um, I guess, an intimate relationship with them? They're, in essence, they're boarding, right, or something. Um, so I, I, I understand, I understand where Representative Dollar is coming from. I think if it's defined in statute, I think that's the safe and easy bet. And perhaps we can, we can, if we do move forward with this bill, we let it go with this language, and if we start to see problems creep in with with other examples of, of abuse, we can always come back and amend uh, after two if we want to. But Representative Dahl. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Senator Hickman, you're very right. I mean, I wasn't intending you know, like boyfriend and girlfriend, but I believe you got my concept because you speak much better than I do. Um, of people living in the same household, um, sharing the responsibilities. I hate to go back to a bill that we have now on our site, knowing that there's a back door and people are pretty smart of using those back doors. So if we can tighten it up and jam it, I don't know if we use the sports betting language when we talk about, like you had mentioned, if, if that's the best thing to do, but I'd like to get that back door closed up. Um, household members, but I guess that could be debatable too, um, which most anything can. That it's it's my opinion, but whatever you know, the committee goes with. I'm with. I guess maybe I'll ask the bill sponsor, are you aware of any, when, when the intent there, were you aware of any instances where the abuse of the system or the payments were made to, to people that weren't family members or in that intimate, that family definition or, or immediate family definition? I was not, I don't know if someone from the ethics commission or there's, there must be someone who can answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't, I don't see anybody in from ethics, but 
um, yeah, and I was I was just wondering if that you know when putting the bill forward, if there was a specific incident that you were aware of that was the catalyst for bringing this forward. So, uh, if not, then that's okay. I'm I'm not aware of any either, but doesn't mean it doesn't exist. I guess right. Um, I am aware of a couple, so I guess okay. that's why I'd like the back door closed. Okay, that's all I have to share on that one. Okay. Um, All right, Mr. Go ahead, Senator Yeah. What is the language in the sports betting or gambling parts of the statute that uh, Janet you referred to and that you have presented? I was just remembering that when we talk about prohibitive wagers, it mm -hmm. talks about members in the household of the licensees and the employees of the licensees. So it's it's basically household members. I, I don't have uh, information on how you know, domestic partner versus household member versus all of those have been interpreted throughout, you know, time. It's just a different approach. I, got you. I don't know how long you have to be in the house to be a household member. Thank you. Okay. Well, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I think we're, 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 I respect where Representative Dollop's coming from. I think if we, by by adding or just expanding the definition, I think we're in a position where we're going to have to overcomplicate it a little bit and get more definition and try and make sure that that's, that's comfortable for everybody. So I personally would be okay with the existing language. And again, if we see, if we are made aware of abuses um, outside of that confines, we can always expand that definition um, uh, uh, if, if it comes to light that 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 is a, an ongoing ongoing problem and ethics may be able to weigh in as well from a from a uh, I don't want to say a rulemaking standpoint but um, you know if they get complaints about that particular issue frequently I'm sure they would come back and say we may need to tighten some things up a little bit as well so um, we do not have sorry Senator Kickman yeah uh, yeah well I, it is true we've given the department rulemaking authority which means if they needed to, they could further define the kind of relationship that should be prohibited from such a payment. You know, in the, in, in uh, let's see, Title 22, domestic partner I just looked up is simply defined as two unmarried adults who are domiciled together under long-term arrangements that evidence a commitment to remain responsible indefinitely for each other's welfare I mean, you could say that that's a boyfriend or a girlfriend who are just going to be together forever. But I, I do think that with respect to the concerns that Representative Dolph has, we have given the department authority to write rules. And if they want to further define prohibited payments based upon some relationship, I suppose they could do that or come back to the legislature and say, please update the definition for immediate family in our laws to include these other relationships. And I, and I just think that maybe that's a great place to leave the discretion to the department, to the commission. Janet? I just realized that domestic partner is defined in um, the voting law, so I can show you that definition if you want. That'd be great. Sure. I love definitions. <laughs> so for purposes of immediate family member under this proposal, the way it would be defined, it includes domestic partner. And this is the applicable definition. Whatever domestic partner means somewhere else doesn't really matter because apparently it was defined in Title 21A, which I did not realize. So it's the partner of a voter, but it's not gonna matter about voter because it's gonna be clear we're not talking about voters here. Who has been legally domiciled with a voter for at least 12 months, is not legally married to or legally separated from another individual, is the sole partner of the voter and expects to remain so and is jointly responsible for each other's common welfare as evidenced by joint living arrangements, joint financial arrangements or joint ownership of real or personal property. So it has this durational requirement, this joint common welfare requirement. So if you leave the current um, phrasing of the amendment or even the bill itself, which talks about immediate family member, it wouldn't include the boyfriends and girlfriends. It wouldn't include the borders who stay for a couple of months to help um, work on the campaign. If it's like a ballot question committee, for example, it wouldn't include any of those folks. 
because they wouldn't meet this definition unless I guess they stay on past the campaign and form a new relationship with you. <laughs> and, oh, I'm sorry. Someone else has a hand up. Absolutely. Uh, Representative Topeka. Yeah, I, um, we're kind of going down the road where that I was going to bring up is that I, I feel pretty confident. Thank you for sharing that. I was trying to, the whole time I was trying to look up the definition of domestic partnership. I feel pretty confident with, with that definition. Like for years, I was in a, in a domestic partnership and we didn't get married until last year. We were together for like seven years, you know, but I feel like the, you know, the definition is, is pretty clear. And I, and I feel confident that it, it would close that back door. Uh, that would have existed for somebody like me, you know, like year and a half, my, my boyfriend, it was weird calling him my boyfriend, but he was my boyfriend for seven years and we lived together. So I, I, I feel confident with that definition, especially the one that was just presented, uh, that it would apply to this. So. If it's any consolation, Representative Speaker, I still call my wife, my girlfriend. So I, I, I you know, if that helps. Uh, Senator Hickman, did you want to add something? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just to say that we wouldn't want to preclude a volunteer who might be boarding with the legislator from getting a payment because they're doing the work of the PAC or the campaign or the leadership PAC or the ballot question committee. So if we say household members, then you know you might be precluding that particular person. And we, I don't think I don't think that that's what we're trying to stop here. I think we're trying to stop. You know, what do they call it? I can't even think of the word, uh, whatever. The, the language is gone. <laughs> I am shocked. I don't think I've ever heard you not have, a, have, the, have the word right there. <laughs> we must be getting long in the session here or something. A, that's the word I'm looking for. Disappoint me, Senator. Nepotism. We're trying to stop nepotism here, right? <laughs> that's what we're trying to stop. <laughs> Representative McCrae. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I think this was a good discussion because we got clear in our own minds, I think. And I think this is a great bill and I'd like to make the motion ought to pass as amended with the amendment we just went over. I don't know if we need to have a full quorum for the motion. Yeah. Um, can I still second it? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, you, you can when it comes through, but we only have, uh, right now we've got five. Um, let me see if I can track down uh, Senator Lucchini. Um, All right. And Representative Representative Wood, maybe. Yes, I know she's in EUT, and I can I can ping her real quick too. I'll write her a few. <laughs> the wonders of modern technology, right? It's Thursday. Yeah. Everybody's yeah. in the meeting today. Except for me, my meeting on the same day. So there you go. <laughs> I'll tell you all that um, after I got married, I made the mistake of saying that Chris was my boyfriend and he looks at me dead in the eye and he goes, husband. I was like, oh, <laughs> sorry. Are there questions from the committee? Oh, mercy. Oh, I think that's- Seeing none, thank you very Wood. much. Uh, and now we'll go to Eric St that's <laughs> Representative Woods got her. Yeah, I know that voice. That's that's that's, <laughs> that's the, my former chair right there. That's that was that was Dad. <laughs> hey, Barb. <laughs> Thanks, Barb. We need one more. Yeah, I just texted Luc uh, Senator Lucchini and Representative Kinney too. I don't know if she's able to. If she's uh, she could be on the back road somewhere without, you know, cell phone coverage. <laughs> exactly. Anybody know any jokes? <laughs> I was just gonna say this is cruel and unusual punishment for a sponsor. To... I, uh, <laughs> we could do the language review on LD eleven seventy eight. I was uh, chasing baby goats earlier. Otherwise, I would have been you know, here for the. Uh... What, what kind? The Nubian or the or the or the, the babies? They escaped. They they're they're just <laughs> they're smarter than I am. And so I think, <laughs> I think I've got them like corralled. But nope, they could find them. Oh. Just... Here we go, Representative Kinney. <laughs> All right, we have seven. Thank you, Representative Kinney. Oh, we lost her. Maybe she's oh. back. Oh, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. All right, so we are. Um, we need a motion for um, LD sixteen twenty one. 
Representative McCray. And I, I would repeat my motion ought to pass as amended. Second. Okay. And seconded by um, Representative Sapika. Uh, Karen, please, if you would, as rapidly as always. <laughs> Uh, Senator Lucchini. Could I, could I quick, what? please have, real quick, tell me what the amendment does. The, the amendment um, is similar to the bill in that it prohibits um, payments to legislators by PACs when the legislator is a principal officer, treasurer, or primary fundraiser or decision maker. Um, it clarifies that that applies if it's either a PAC or a ballot question committee. It also clarifies around travel expenses, that travel expenses generally can be paid to the legislator for their legislative duties or volunteering for the committee, except that when they use their own car, it's limited to mileage reimbursement and not direct payments for repairing or maintaining the vehicle. It also clarifies that the legislator can be um, fined for accepting payments that are prohibited or for commingling funds with the committee. And it also clarifies that the committee itself can be um, fined for making the prohibited payments to the legislators, for making prohibited payments to the immediate family members of a legislator or a business that's an immediate owned by immediate family member of the legislator. And then also the PAC or ballot question committee can be fined for commingling of the funds. So it's similar, but it clarifies um, the travel expenses piece, it clarifies that it extends to ballot question committees and it clarifies who's responsible for which violations. Thank and you, I think, yeah, I think gonna, and I think, if, and I'll re let Representative Dolliff weigh in real quickly if she wants to, but I think we addressed her concerns around uh, the domestic partnership uh, ar arrangements as well. Yeah, Ma uh, Mary, oh, Representative Kinney, um, I just have known um, like payments to boyfriends, girlfriends, you know. And I want, just want to close the back door on how to take care of that. And the definitions we got for domestic partner take really does take care of my concerns. Great, thank you. All right, if we're ready, Karen, if you could proceed with the role, that would be great. Senator Lucchini. Senator Lucchini. Absent. Senator Hickman. Yay. Senator Hickman. Yay. Senator Farron. Senator Farron. Absent. Representative Chiazzo. Yes. Representative Chiazzo. Yes. Representative McCrate. Yes. Representative McCrate. Yes. Representative Tuttle. Representative Tuttle. Absent. Representative Riley. Representative Riley. Absent. Representative Tupica. Yes. Representative Tupica. Yes. Representative Wood. Yes. Representative Wood, yes. Representative Kinney. Uh, yes. Representative Kinney, yes. Representative Harrington. Representative Harrington, absent. Representative Corey. Representative Corey, absent. Representative Dollop. Yes. Representative Dollop, yes. Seven in favor of the motion, zero opposed to the motion, and six members absent, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Karen. So the motion ought to pass as amended prevails with the majority of those present. Those absent have until noon tomorrow to vote. I very much appreciate everybody's flexibility, including the uh, bill sponsor for, for uh, entertaining us while we, we do the quick song and dance and shuffle of the squares. Uh, I will conclude the work sessions um, for the morning. And Janet, I know we have language review, but I, I'd like to move that to this afternoon if we could, because we got 15 minutes before um, uh, public hearing starts at one, and I'd like to give people a chance to get a quick bite if they could, if that's all right. Hey, just text or call me because it's not my here. So. Okay, okay, all right, thank you. Thank you for that. So uh, if there are any questions or concerns, we will uh, recess for 15 minutes to let people grab a bite. Thank you, Janet, for your for your work as always this morning, and we will see everybody back here at one o'clock. Thank you.
I'm ready to roll. Anybody else? <laughs> I gotta go back and see my goats. Come on, y'all. <laughs> I I tried texting everybody. So the good news is, is we don't need a quorum to start, but we we need at least a member. <laughs> Well, I've got the goods because I'm presenting the bill on behalf of the bill sponsor who has to be somewhere else. So I'm ready whenever anybody else is. <laughs> Thank you. I know I, I talked to, to Representative Talbot Ross yesterday in session and she mentioned she had um, led counsel today. So I appreciate you stepping up as always. <sighs> we'll give a, another minute or so, I think, for people to come back on and we can we can get started. All right, uh, we might as well get cranking. I'll do the uh, obligatory announcements. Uh, good afternoon, welcome to the Joint Standing Committee on Veterans and Legal Affairs. Uh, the committee is assembled electronically today for the purpose of inviting the public comment on legislation. Before we get started, I wanna share some inform information related to the fact that this meeting is being conducted using an electronic format. This meeting is currently being live streamed on the committee's YouTube channel. This means that anyone who is a participant in the meeting via Zoom can be seen and also heard if their microphone is unmuted. People on the Zoom meeting waiting to testify cannot be seen or heard until they are called upon to speak. This meeting will be recorded and available to view the committee's YouTube channel soon after this meeting has concluded. You should also know that uh, it may momentarily appear as though you've been dropped from the meeting uh, when we call on you to speak, it takes a second or two to be to uh, come back in, but rest assured you will reappear and we will then be able to provide your testimony. Uh, as a reminder, the Zoom chat function is not to be used for substantive discussion by anyone. Uh, and having said all of those things, which I think we're used to hearing uh, this late in the session, we will begin by uh, opening up the work session, uh, excuse me, the public hearing for LD 1589, which is an act to ensure the equity in the cannabis industry, sponsored by uh, Representative Rachel Talbot Ross of Portland. Um, unfortunately, uh, Representative Talbot Ross is not able to join us this afternoon. Um, in her stead, uh, Senator Hickman has agreed to introduce the bill. So Senator Hickman, when you are ready, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as one of the co-sponsors of the bill, I am happy to present this testimony on behalf of Assistant Majority Leader, Rachel Talbot Ross, Senator Lucchini, Representative Chiazzo, and distinguished members of the Joint Standing Committee on Veterans and Legal Affairs. I am Rachel Talbot Ross. I represent House District 40 in Portland and serve as Assistant House Majority Leader. I apologize that I cannot be with you today to present LD 1589 and act to ensure equity in the cannabis industry. I am presenting in a proposed amendment, which is attached to this testimony for your consideration. As you will see, the amendment would increase the membership of the Marijuana Advisory Commission from 15 to 21 members. It specifies the additional members should include a member of the public with an expertise in cultivation or manufacturing, a representative of a statewide association of defense attorneys, a representative of a statewide civil rights and racial justice organization, a qualifying patient, a tribal member, and a representative of a civil liberties organization. Finally, it directs that appointments be made with an effort to represent our state's racial and gender diversity. This proposed amendment brings forth the work that was done last year by this committee on then LD 2091. Like so much of our work, that bill died when we adjourned early due to the COVID-19 pandemic. However, it had unanimous support of this committee I hope you will join me in advancing it this session. The intent is to ensure the membership of the Marijuana Advisory Commission is representative of the diversity of our state and acknowledges the historic and current dynamics of inequity and injustice surrounding cannabis in our state and nation. I'm grateful to Senator Hickman for speaking to this proposal in more detail, as well as to the chairs and the committee as a whole for your time and attention to this matter. Please feel welcome to contact me with any questions. I look forward to joining you for the work session. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Hickman, and also Representative uh, uh, Rachel Talbert Ross as well. Um, any questions for the co sponsor from the committee? 
All right, seeing none, we will proceed to the public hearing portion. Uh, we have um, Alicia Melnick uh, signed up to testify, so I will bring Alicia in. Uh, just a reminder to those in the public, please uh, state your name, who you represent, where you're from. Um, uh, we typically keep to three minutes, but I think this is going to be a very short, uh, short hearing. Um, I know um, we have, uh, unfortunately, we've had very limited um, notice. Um, we're, we're trying to get things as we can close to the end of the session, and I apologize, not everybody's had uh, the ability to, to react as, with as much lead time as we can, but we're, 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 we're trying to get everything done at the last minute here. So, um, Ms. Melnick, when you are ready, you have the floor. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it, um, Chair Chiazzo and Chair Lucchini and members of the Veterans and Legal Affairs Committee. My name is Alicia Melnick. I am an attorney at Bernstein Sure. I'm a resident of Portland, and I'm here today to testify in support of LD 1589 and the amendment that was presented by the sponsor, um, Representative Talbot Ross. Uh, I am actually a member of the commission of the body that she is seeking to amend membership on, and I am in wholehearted support of those amendments. Uh, the body as it exists has only met in person once, and um, I don't believe in part uh, that's because it's, it doesn't necessarily have the membership that would be able to provide you all with the kind of guidance um, around the proposals on this very complicated longstanding medical and adult use cannabis industries. Um, I think the membership that is suggested in the uh, amendment before you, which seeks to address issues of equity, especially um, equity in terms of who's been most uh, impacted by the drug war and the, um, it, and, uh, the history of, of cannabis being illegal in our country is really important, as well as having more practitioners, people who are um, best able, you know, farmers and people who are our actual participants in this industry to help provide really thoughtful analysis um, of current laws and policies and recommendations about how to improve both the medical and the adult use programs. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions about the work that's been done thus far on the body or, um, or at how this uh, commission came to exist, but um, I urge you to support this amended language and uh, appreciate your thoughtful consideration of this and all the cannabis bills before you. Thank you, Ms. Melnick. Um, any questions from the committee? All right, seeing none, thank you for your testimony this afternoon. Um, that concludes those on the list to testify, but again, I know we had a very short public notice, so um, I do see quite a few people in the attendees room. So um, uh, we, we can open that up. Um, I will recognize Chairman Lucchini first. Sorry, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just for people watching too, just so you know, the, the amendment is available under um, uh, Assistant Majority Leader's testimony on the website. So if you wanna see the text, it's right there. I, I don't know if that was said earlier. Um, I neglected to say that, thank you. Yeah, no, I, I didn't see it either, so yeah. <laughs> thank you. Um, okay, I see a couple of hands up there. So I will bring in, um, in this order, we'll bring in Mark Barnett first, uh, followed by Arlie Krauss, and then uh, Ms. Susan Meehan. And I'm not sure, there we go. A little delayed here for some reason. All right, Mr. Barnett. Uh, sorry about that. No worries, no worries. Uh, sorry for the last can minute. Hear me? We can hear you, but we can't see you. So if you're okay with that, then you may proceed. <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, there you are. First and foremost, uh, yep, members of the committee, the chairs, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, my name is Mark Barnett. I am a resident of Auburn, Maine. I own a medical a retail caregiver store in Portland, and I'm the executive chair of the Maine Craft Cannabis Association. Um, we are, uh, and I did submit some brief written testimony um, as well. 
uh, obviously working on a somewhat short timeline, but um, we definitely would like the committee um, to pass 1589 and to consider the spirit of the um, amended language, um, particularly as um, it brings in some new voices and perspectives, um, particularly as the previous speaker alluded to around those who have um, disproportionately been negatively affected by the, um, yeah, by the decades of stigma and drug war um, in the state and in this country. Um, and also as it brings in, um, and we would hope to see more representation from in particular the medical marijuana industry, which is not a new industry and which has a long and deep um, yeah, body of experience and, um, and perspective to bring to this committee. Um, I think that in general, it would be best to model something like more off of the, maybe the pesticide control board, which is really focused on, um, on operators as its core. Um, and, and folks with direct experience, I think we've seen and full display uh, why the disparity is um, and the actual industry and the people. Um, Mr. Mr. Barnett, I, I'm sorry to interrupt you. You're, you're in that. Um, by having a bit more guidance. So um, we support. Breaking up. Thank you, Mr. Burnett. I, I'm sorry, I, my I, signal's your, quite poor. Your but internet I is breaking time. up quite a bit. Um, so I just yeah. conclude by saying, "Yep, thank you very much for the time." Thank you, sir. Apologize for the technical difficulties. I think we got the gist of what you were saying, though, so I appreciate that. Uh, next up, we'll have uh, Arlie Kraus, please. Hi, can everyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you and see you. Okay, great, thanks. <laughs> um, greetings. Um, Senator Lucchini, Representative Chiazzo, and members of the Committee on Veterans and Legal Affairs. My name is Arlie Krauss. I am a registered cannabis caregiver, farmer, and business owner in Warren, Maine. I'm a founding member of the Maine Craft Cannabis Association. I am a member of the Seed to Help Learning Health Alliance, and I am the chair of the Adult and Medical Marijuana Committee for the town of Warren. I've been a caregiver in Maine for over 10 years. I've been able to support my family, grow my farm and meet and care for some lovely people who seek me out for the plant medicine I provide. Today, I am testifying in support of LD 1589, an act to ensure equity in the cannabis industry. LD 1589 is a bill which will provide support for the producers, the farmers, and the experts in the main cannabis industry and address how rule and policy changes will impact this industry prior to implementation of policy change. By bringing the membership from 15 to 21 participants, it will only help the program. A body of individuals who can assess rules objectively while taking into consideration not only the cannabis businesses, but also patients and consumers and the citizens of Maine will only help to strengthen and unify our cannabis program as a whole. A well-rounded group would provide guidance which is thoughtful, objective, and grounded in experience. Thank you for your consideration, and I urge you to pass LD 1589. Thank you, Ms. Krauss. Any questions from the committee? All right, seeing none, thank you for your testimony this afternoon. I appreciate thank you. that. Uh, up next, we have uh, Susan Meehan. Good afternoon, honorable members of the Veterans and Legal Affairs Committee. It's a beautiful day here. My name is Susan Meehan, and I'm chairperson of the United Cannabis Patients and Caregivers of Maine, DBA Maine Cannabis Coalition. I support LD 1589 as it seeks inclusion of actual stakeholders in the program on this advisory board. However, I suggest that we could really make a difference if we also considered assigning some real work and consider implementation of a medical marijuana advisory board. According to public record, this current Marijuana Advisory Commission met only once on October 24th, 2019 for two hours. By chap Title 28, Chapter 1, Subchapter 9, indicates that this commission is created for the purpose of conducting a continuous study of laws relating to marijuana and reporting to the legislature its findings and recommendations on an annual basis. While the commission has little power, they seem to have skipped their annual meeting in 2020. 
It seems that this commission has no authority and very few responsibilities. Currently, OMP creates rules in disregard of Maine's Title V by hiring outside Maine consultants to write outside of Maine consultants to write the rules that impact Maine citizens and Maine's real stakeholders. Activists such as the coalition of which I am chairperson are begging for your help and doing the real research and the reporting while this advisory commission doesn't have enough responsibility or work. OMP and the corporate giants that lead them are laughing at us. They're trying to muddy the waters and not allow you, our legislators, to do your jobs. They lie to you repeatedly. I beseech you to please be Maine's champion. Please listen to us and do not sell our programs to the giant corporate interests, whether in adult use, like this commission, or in our medical program for which I fight to protect daily. At the current time, this commission is a mention on a resume. The commission would actually have to assemble and have work assigned to accomplish anything. Perhaps the, the committee should assign some real tasks to the commission as they consider appointment of some real stakeholders. I'm not saying this out of disrespect. The commission truly has no legislative power, no statute of power, no authority, and not much of a job for statute. And it seems that they have trouble even with the one meeting a year. Appointing fewer political Resume appointees, multiple patients, multiple caregivers, healthcare professionals who certify patients, a dispensary owned by someone <coughs> other than Acreage Holdings, then assign them some real work. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you, Representative Talbot Ross, for putting this forth this bill. I hope the legislature can reform this commission into a real working body that can protect Maine as we grow this rapidly developing industry and try to keep some of the funds from it here in Maine economy. Please do the right thing. You have an opportunity to be our champion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Meehan. Any questions from the committee? Uh, Senator Hickman? Yeah, uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Ms. Meehan, can you talk just, are you suggesting that we need a bigger commission that has a medical marijuana focus or a separate commission for the medical marijuana program. I'm trying to understand that part of your I, time. I believe that, right. Um, I guess I would say either if the if the commission were given some assignment and some work to do, it could be a combined commission, but I suggest that a medical marijuana advisory board that actually focuses upon mar medical marijuana and the program that's been operating here for so many years here in Maine would probably be a better solution um, because the programs are so different. I realize that the executive has directed that we align the programs, but I feel that a medicine is far different than something tantamount to alcohol, even though it's the same property, the same, <laughs> the same product, um, there are far, far differences in the use and application and the guidance that people receive from their healthcare providers and the medical program versus the adult use program. Thank you. So I guess I could go with either is my answer, but I think that the the biggest problem is they don't have any work to do. They're not assigned any work to do and they're they're just not real. They're a resume. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Hickman. Any other questions for Ms. Meehan while we have her here? All right, seeing none. Thank you, Ms. Meehan, for your for your testimony. You're welcome. Have a great day. You as well. Uh, anybody else in the attendee room who wishes to testify? If so, please raise your virtual hand and we will bring you in. Okay, not seeing anybody, then uh, we will close the public hearing on LD 1589. And I see our Wonder Analyst, Ms. Stoko has joined us again, so I don't need to text her. And I think we can move on to language reviews uh, if you are ready. Thank you. There's just one and it's not gonna shock anyone, I don't think. So this is LD 1178, the resolution to propose an amendment to the constitution to prohibit the consideration of the people's veto at a presidential primary. This was voted out to pass as amended with a fiscal note only amendment. And you will be shocked to see what the amendment is. 
So the fiscal note does provide that if there are sufficient number of questions where there's an additional ballot page required that there may need to be an additional appropriation of $172,000 for the production and delivery of ballots for the general election in November. Uh, thank you, Janet. Can you just scroll up? Because I'm not sure who else was on the, uh, there we go. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Lucchini. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sorry, I was just going to ask to see the vote. Okay. Oh, I see, I see it there. I, don't why I didn't list the four on on the passes. List the other four. <laughs> I can send anyone the vote sheet who wants it because Karen very kindly sends it to me. Yeah. No, no, no worries. Anybody on the majority report that, that has any questions or concerns? Okay, seeing none, then uh, I guess we're good. We're good. Any other business we need to take care of, Janet? From your end? Oh, only all the bills left in our possession. But we did have approval for the extension. Do you want to run votes right now for all of them? Because I think we could, well, never mind, I won't say that. <laughs> no, no, I want you to have the information you need when you vote it. Really, I do. I know you do. Thank you for that. We very much appreciate that. Uh, any other questions, comments for committee members? Senator Farron, thank you for joining us. We missed you today. You didn't really miss me today, but I appreciate the sentiment. And I've been uh, kind of about, I've been listening. I get transportation going on too, as you guys know, multiple stuff, but uh, appreciate uh, you thinking of me. Sir. Always, always in the kindest of ways, sir. Hi, thank you. <laughs> we have a lot of doublers with both Senator Farron as well as Sam are doubling today with transportation and us. So. <clears throat> All right. Well, if there's nothing else, I certainly will not keep everybody. Um, we, I appreciate the work we did today and, and the flexibility of everybody. Um, we did a lot of bouncing around, but we, you know, we're able to get some bills off our table, which is great. And I think we are starting tomorrow at 10 a.m., if I'm not mistaken. Um, with the budget. With the, yeah, budget review. Thank you. Um, so if there are any questions or comments, then thank you for today's work. And we will see you all tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. And we will consider the public hearing and this meeting closed. Thank you.